I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Marty, will you do roll call attendance, please? Sure. Mary Jo Rathmaster? Here. Mary Jo Radcliffe? Here. Patty Jacobson? Here. Laurel Meek? Here. Amy Huffman? Nahoma Thundercloud? Here. Scott Barton? Here. Okay, thank you. Has the meeting been noticed um, to the public according to open meeting laws? Yes. Thank you. Okay, at this time, um, I would like to recommend some agenda movement. Um, for under number six, we'll start with board accommodation and then move to focus on purpose, financial institutions, and then student discipline. Is that a motion? Yes, I make a motion to move the agenda item. Move. A second. Thank you. Um, any discussion on that? All in favor say yes. 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 Okay, motion carried. Well, at this time, we'll start with public comment. Is there anyone who wishes to address the board with an item that's not on the agenda? Okay. Yes. Just to be clear, I did put student discipline on the agenda, oh, so like you had requested. Then? Yeah. Okay, great. That's what you had requested. And yes. So, okay. Okay. You're, 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 yeah, you're addressing the board. So, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Okay. I'm just not used to as many people being here because I'm on uh, a county board, so nobody shows up for those ones. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> all right, so I am. The microphone is actually so that the video, the tape picks oh. it up because people watch it. You might be surprised really? to know people watch it. And so the microphone allows it to go to the camera. It doesn't amplify you in the room. Okay, me. all right. So I'm Max Hart. Um, I know some of you. I had Mrs. Radcliffe for a second grade teacher. I'm here to announce my candidacy for the 92nd Assembly District. Uh, the district encompasses the western half of Jackson County, uh, most of Trapolo and Buffalo counties. Um, I, run, I'm, I am running as a Democrat. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I live in between Blackburn and Melrose. I am actually in the Blackburn Falls School District, and I went to school here in Blackburn Falls, actually. I went to school at Third Street Elementary, so a little piece of my heart broke last year uh, when they tore it down. Um, right now, I work at the bank, uh, Blackburn Country Bank down in Melrose. I'm an ag loan officer down there. Um, I also farm with my mom. We got some beef cows, and I got some corn, hay, and beans. Um, so I've been passionate about the rural communities, and the 92nd District is a very rural community, so that's why I wanted to run. I'm also on the county board, so I see some of the difficulties that local governments have to deal with, with uh, tightened budgets. So I'm running. Uh, I have a degree in ag education, so I've been in the classrooms and I've taught, um, not as a full-time teacher, but as a substitute teacher. Um, but uh, I, I want to run. And I just believe that over the last couple of years, um, our schools have been living in kind of a starvation wage and starvation budgets. And so if I was to get elected, I'd work with my counterparts down at Madison to try to strengthen our local budgets for our schools and also for our local governments like county government and your townships and such. Um, other than that, this kind of rural revitalization, you look at Blackmer Falls, there's not a whole lot going on downtown. So um, I work at the bank, so I kind of have a little bit of knowledge when it comes to financial stuff and people kind of come up with some capital. And so I want to work with uh, businesses and organizations to help strengthen our local communities. And as we have stronger communities, we have a stronger tax base, and that would help include uh, stronger funding for your schools. And also, <laughs> on a grander scheme, I would like to address how the state funds itself. Uh, right now, we fund itself, um, your, the schools fund itself a lot of property taxes, and it'd be kind of nice to readdress that and do more state aid. Uh, so that way the, uh, the school districts have more even distribution of financial aid. So I think it's almost three minutes there. Yeah, you, you stuck to the timeline. Thank All you, right, Mr. Thank Hart. Thank you. And thank you for your support of education, public education. Okay, um, the next. Anyone else for public comment? Oh, yes. Anyone else have a comment? I'm sorry. Okay. Now we'll move down to community engagement. We'll have board accommodation, and we have representatives from the PTO tonight. Ladies, we come forward. We are very excited to present Tasha Koresh and Janelle Berkowitz, 
Witch. 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 Sorry about that. Um, with a board commendation for their incredible work with the PTO. Over the course of time in Black River Falls, we have had extremely high functioning PTOs. When I first came as a principal, you were the PTO president of that building. We have ebbed and flowed, but unfortunately, in the last couple of years, there has been a non existent PTO at the elementary level. And so it is hard enough to take over the reins from somebody else. It is extremely difficult to start from scratch. And so we are so appreciative. We fully recognize that whole saying, we are better together, we are stronger together, we need the partnership from the families in order to um, uh, make progress with the kids, and it just feels so much better when we're working together. These ladies have started family movie nights at Red Creek, which have been very, very heavily attended, um, and it, like any youth organization, a very small number of people are doing the majority of the heavy lifting. We recognize that, and we appreciate it. They just did a huge fundraiser. Um, what was your grand total of, raise, of profit? Uh, we don't know the okay. very end total yet, but we had $12,866. From the fundraiser that they put together with the elementary students. So they have just done exemplary work, and their mission is finding ways to connect families with their child's school experience. And so we're just so appreciative that they're willing to dig in and do that work. So thank you so very much, ladies. Thank you so much. Yes. It, did you want to say anything? You said they don't feel prepped. You are struggling. Did you want to make any comments? <laughs> nope. Did we put you on the spot? <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it kind of started off small last year. We only did one movie night. We're trying to grow things bigger and do more things and hopefully. So far the response has been extremely positive. A right? lot of people are willing to help. A lot of people just, I don't think people are able to come to like meetings and stuff like that. So, but, you know, asking for volunteers, parents are like, oh yeah, I can do this or I can do that. So That is a very true statement and has been for years. If you ask people to come to a meeting to organize something, you get very, very few. Mm -hmm. Ask someone to do a specific task and they'll almost always they'll fill it in. So, yeah. thanks so much. And all right, a lot of times when you volunteer, you don't expect, you know, the recognition or the thank yous and things like that. So, thank you all very much for oh, this. Yes. Very thank important. You. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. And next, we'll have Focus on Purpose, the Green and Healthy School Initiative. Yeah. Is, is this working? So if you would like to speak to them uh -huh. and there, you might want to stay in this area-ish. One of you wants to take this, and one of you needs the clicker. So forward, backward, pointer, if you want to be real All right, so hello and good evening. My name is Michaela Gilbertson, and I am a junior currently at the Black River Falls High School. And I'm here with my partner for this project and our teacher from the high school, Mrs. Claire Canodal and Emma Goodenough. Um, we're just here tonight to kind of introduce you guys to a new program we're going to be starting in all of the schools. It's titled the Green and Healthy Schools of Wisconsin and the Green and Healthy School Initiative. I'm trying to advance it. Is that working? She's got the computer. So you can point the red dot at Jill and then she'll <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. All right, so our purpose mainly for today is just to educate people and of our community and of our school district on what we are doing to reduce our school's environmental impact and costs. And then our ultimate goal is to implement this program at all levels, um, all schools of the, in the district. Oh, did it work now? Yeah, I think it worked. Yeah. All right, so a little background on the Green and Healthy Schools of Wisconsin program. It's a department. It's a program through the Department of Public, in Department of Public Instruction, the Wisconsin DNR, and UW Stevens Point. Um, the program provides schools with information and resources to carry out different initiatives at their schools. We received um, like a very lengthy booklet on tips and. Um, like other programs that we can implement at our school with uh, signing up for the program. Miguel, just you know, the board all got that packet oh. in their board packet, okay. so they've had that to review for okay. a couple days, so they know what you're talking about. Okay, perfect. And then um, it basically just encourages schools to reduce their environmental impact and costs, and it will help out both the schools and the environment in the long run. So in the Green and Healthy Schools program, there are nine areas of emphasis and they're all listed up there. We have currently been working in the 
um, recycling and waste management program, um, starting with our milk carton recycling. So, so far for our progress, we have been able to implement the milk carton recycling at all um, schools within the district. We've mainly been working at the high school level, but have taken time to go to each of the other dis or schools in the district. Um, Ms. Canodal took action in first getting us involved with this program, and with prog as we progress, we can receive recognition nationally. Could you describe what the milk carton recycling program looks like at the... Oh, it's coming. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I set you up for the Grand Slam here. Sorry. <laughs> okay, yeah, I see that. So these are all the different levels of the program. So we started as a sprout school, and then as you can see, it just goes on. But we are a seedling school right now. And we are focused, as Kayla said, we're focusing on the recycling and waste management, but as we progress in further projects, we will progress in the program. So we've partnered with many people during this project, um, Kayla and myself, Ms. Canoto, the janitorial and kitchen staff, Joe Smith and Connie Seaver have been a big help in this project with helping us communicate to other janitors and lunch ladies in the different schools. Mr. Chambers has helped us a lot too and then mainly students and staff. Students have been a big part in actually implementing the project. So we did make videos, like how-to videos. We went to each of the schools one morning and Kayla and I walked through the process and the videos like are specialized that show each of the different lunchrooms and their setup. Yeah. yeah. Did you? I clicked on it. Oh man. If it doesn't work, that's fine. It's it um it just shows me and Emma walking through the the walking through like dumping out a milk carton and then recycling it into the big yellow bins and um, it's just different for each school so the kids like see it how they're gonna do it. Yeah, I don't know why it does that when I try to play videos. Oh, oh there it is. Have you ever thought about how our school district's waste is affecting our world? When garbage is placed in a landfill, it releases toxins such as methane and carbon dioxide into the atmosphere that contribute to global warming, a national concern. We will be implementing a new recycling program at all of the schools in the upcoming weeks. This new process is super easy and could possibly reduce our info waste by two loads a month. When going through the Can lunch put line, the microphone dump your, to dump your tray, so you take there will the be two five-gallon buckets on a cart. Oh. You will first dump the milk out into these buckets. Then you will throw your empty milk carton into the big yellow can. Please join us in helping make our school district green and healthy. Anyway, they talked about the benefits of recycling, and then they showed the kids what to do. So the start of the carton recycling started last week on February 13th in all schools and videos were sent out a few days before so that teachers had the opportunity to show the students what they were doing before they actually started. Um, at the high school we had students from Ms. Halstead's class that are still standing by the garbage cans each day making sure that um, all the students at the high school are recycling their milk cartons and hopefully throughout this milk carton recycling we will save the school district money with garbage transport and help our environment. And these are some images that we took on the first few days that we implemented the project of kids recycling their milk cartons. Um, so, okay. Alright, so as well as working in the recycling and waste management program, we've also um, made progress in the environmental and sustainability education area. Um, we've created a green team at the high school with the help of Ms. Canodal. Um, we actually have had our first few meetings and we've had a lot of attendance, so that's awesome. And the, this green team will be able to help with this project and future projects to come. We plan to take um, some kids from this green team to visit Colby High School March 9th to explore their progress in this program. Colby High School is 
has made um, progress in many areas of the Green and Healthy Schools program. So it's nice for, that they're able to let us come in and see how they're doing things. Some of our future plans, we plan and hope to get one representative from each school to become a leader. Um, if we have someone at each school that's a leader for this program, it'll be much easier to communicate and get things done smoothly. We want to focus on energy, water, and school site areas of the program. So um, for school site, that's like the school forest. And then we want to keep advancing in the ranks. And our final points, um, this is Emma and I's FCCLA project. So we present at state uh, April 9th. So we hope to keep um, advancing in competition there. Also, we want to in educate kids on, the environment, on our environmental impact. It is important for kids to learn this, and school is the best place as they're going to be going out into the real world and making their own decisions. And we're just calling for support for this program and asking all of our community members and people, our school district personnel, to get involved and support the program. So if there's any questions, we're open for them. I was looking at the application forms for each area, and they're quite extensive. Did you have to fill all that out? Yeah. Well, <laughs> yes, but Very I don't. I can't. I, I'm really at a loss with each school. I have to do separately, okay. and so with this green team, I've put together some teams, like energy teams, and they're going to actually go to those schools and try to figure out some of that information. Okay. But again, it would help if I would have a representative in those schools. But at present, I don't. So um, in middle to... school, I sort of do, um, <clears throat> but not in any of the grade schools. And when these young lady leaders um, graduate, there will be others um, that would be moving up in the ranks as you're creating those leaders within each school. Yes. Thank you. And just to be clear, they get to go on to state because they've already competed once yeah. and they earned the right to go on to state from this project. So congratulations to you. Ladies. And certainly use this opportunity that you've presented to the board as one of your community outreach um, listings. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, you did a very, very nice job. Thank you. And thank you for your work. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. started with um, a comment of appreciation for everybody shuffling their schedules this week. Uh, Mother Nature wasn't kind to us on Monday, and so we appreciate everyone who is scheduled to be here Monday, shuffling, shuffling, and being able to be here tonight. So thank you for that as well. Yes. Okay, um, we're going to move on to 6.2, um, financial institutions at the high school. And I've um, just to be very fair, I'm going to go alphabetical order and give Black River Country Bank the first option to present to us. Is it because it's Bob Becker, Black Bob River? Bob Becker, Black River <laughs> Country Bank, yeah. He was covered there. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to ask the same that you please use the microphone. Well, thank you, Dr. Severson and the uh, school board for inviting me to talk tonight. I I appreciate the opportunity uh, to come tonight. Um, if you don't know who I am, I'm Bob Becker, president of the Black River Country Bank. Um, I applaud the Black River Falls School District and the state of Wisconsin for their forward thinking in, in where financial literacy is going and how strong we need to be at the school districts for this. Um, I definitely think it's important, and, and I'm glad to see that the, the state has come along, and I, I think Black River was ahead of that game quite a ways anyway, so that's, that's terrific. Uh, we at Black River Country Bank are strong believers in financial literacy. Over the years, we've uh, attempted to offer our services uh, to all the Jackson County schools uh, through the such things as classroom presentations, junior achievement, uh, tours and presentations at our location, job shadowing, youth apprenticeship, uh, just to name a few. And we, we're proud of that work and we want to do even more. And that's what we're here tonight is to talk about maybe what more we can do for you. Tonight I was asked to discuss having a financial institution at the high school. The Black River Country Bank is not interested in having a financial institution at the high school or any other school. We don't think that's an appropriate path to teach our kids financial literacy. The act of opening up an account is not the spot of the school. 
the spot of the school is teaching our kids financial literacy and learning, giving them the tools to go out and make those proper decisions. To offer any institution, and we have a lot of fine institutions in our county, the opportunity to have a captive audience is not the path that we think you should consider. What I'm going to propose to you is a collaborative effort of all the local financial institutions that are willing to participate in continuing to enhance your financial literacy program. I know you've already got a curriculum in place. There's a lot of curriculums out there. We have did a lot of research on one. We personally like the Money Smart Financial Literacy Curriculum. We would suggest that, but by no means do we feel like that is the only program that's out there. I do have a handout here that I'm going to hand out to you when I wrap up, a little bit of a guideline of the program. But the way we see it is your staff would continue to lead a program. Financial institutions are there to help you out with our expertise, our resources, uh, I feel like, I can't speak for anybody else other than the Black River Country Bank, but I feel like from past performance of the financial institutions in our community that the majority of them would be on board with continuing to help like we always have in the past. Uh, in addition to a curriculum at the school, I think one thing that's very, very important for any financial literacy is getting extreme buy-in from your students. And part of that, from the Money Smart program, is getting the students involved in teaching it. So part of this program would include having internships where students are going into local financial institutions and learning how to come back and be the part of the teaching program at the schools. From where I'm at tonight, that's how the Black River Country Bank sees being the best way of moving forward, continuing to teach financial literacy in the school. And again, I thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Becker? Explain your student internships a little bit more, that you, how you're seeing that would work. You said they'd come back and be the teachers of financial literacy with the students? I have one. I'll take them and finish hitting them all so you can talk about The internship program, while there would be some gray areas of, of where it would be right now, because we'd have to talk about it as the group that would want to be willing to collaborate on this. But the way I would see it would be students being inter um, identified by the school staff as the appropriate ones to participate in this, probably coming out of the business classes. Uh, but before they become part of the education team, they're going out to the local financial institutions on an internship. It's not just an internship working at our front counter or answering our telephones or shredding our papers for us, coming into the financial institutions and getting a well-rounded basis, uh, sort of on-the-job training over a pre-period of two weeks to a month where they're coming back and can show their skills and their knowledge of, you know, just part of it's writing checks. You have to know how to budget, you have to know how to plan for car loans, plan to purchase things. So it's a lot of things. But that's how I envision it, Mary Jo, is, is actually coming into the financial institutions and working in all departments with the staff there. Okay, any more comments or questions for Mr. Becker? You had mentioned the other um, financial institutions in the area. You're envisioning that those internships would be available at a variety of different institutions. That would that would be my goal, and, and you know again, if this if this got off the ground, uh, I'd be happy to be heavily involved in doing it and steering it. But if there's someone else that wanted to take a steering lead too, but I I really firmly believe that you know in the past, while we're competitors out there, and every day on Main Street where we work, we're competing when it comes to the you know schools and children and stuff. There's plenty of room to collaborate together and work together. Everyone might have their own feeling for the areas at a financial institution that they might want to expose the students to, but uh, most of them are going to see a good share of everything. So I, yes, I think other places would be involved too. I would second uh, Mr. Becker's comments that we have 
had very generous donations of time and effort from many of when we do our reality days or any of that stuff, we have um, no problem getting institutions being willing to be helpful. That's for certain. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, now I'd like to invite um, representatives from the Co-op Credit Union. Marianne. Thank you, Dr. Severson and uh, school board members for giving me the opportunity to come and talk a little bit about uh, Tiger Credit Union. Credit unions were formed with a philosophy of people helping people and we're passionate about financial literacy at Co-op Credit Union. This passion led us to reaching out three years ago to talk about opening an in-school credit union, which is a student-run branch uh, with our uh, three to five students staffing that branch at the school. Wisconsin credit unions continue to pursue statewide initiatives to promote financial wellness and the in-school branch opportunities. There are currently about 98 student-run branches throughout the state of Wisconsin. And the whole goal is to help students understand financial literacy and make the best decisions that they can as they move forward through life. The goal at Tiger Credit Union is not opening accounts and transactions. I don't think we've I'm certain we have not opened one account at Tiger Credit Union in the three years that we've been there. We average two to five transactions um, each shift, and several of those are the adult staff at the high school. Our role and our passion is really in financial literacy. We've offered several presentations uh, at different levels of the school district. Um, worked with the Mad City Money Reality Day for several years, and Mrs. Christensen's uh, excuse me personal finance classes. Um, our students, when they run the credit union, are looking for ways to reach out to their peers. They have said to us that that peer-to-peer -peer conversation and opportunity to interact with someone their age, people that they're in class with, has really been an effective method. One of the things that the students have worked really hard at is implementing the money minutes, which are a one minute or so uh, video that are shared through the video announcements at the high school about once a week. And for instance, the last two sessions that we did uh, for Money Minute, one was on, on sales, should you shop sales. Well, just remember that if it's 50% off, it's still 50% on. And is it a purchase you should be making? They've talked about things like not buying when you're in an emotional state. It's not good to shop when you're angry. When you're hungry, don't go to the grocery store. <laughs> um, or when you're sad. We've also, in the last couple of years, really ramped up our um, financial investment challenge bowl work that we've done with the school. And um, Asset Builders has a quiz bowl type situation where students go to a regional competition. Last year we had two teams from the high school, and this past year we had four teams for the high school. They, however, could not um, go to the competition because it was a weather incident. So um, I know, I know, and it was close school. <laughs> it was our. First year then of letting this, we put together a regional competition in lacrosse so that it was closer for the students to go. So credit unions throughout our chapter in our region all pooled efforts and had, um, you know, like I think it was 10 teams from different schools participate and then um, with the possibility of moving on to state. Having Tiger Credit, Tiger credit Union on site allows, again, for those students to interact with students. Um, the credit union is currently open two days during the lunch period, and our student staff is out in the lunchroom with the students, talking about them and what their financial needs are. We're doing things like budgeting workshops each quarter at the middle school for all eighth grade students, and um, are very active in things like junior achievement. Our future plans, if they move forward, are to branch out into the other schools, and um, provide age-appropriate presentations, work in the classroom, and getting the students to help with that sort of thing. 
We do have three to five student employees, student MSRs we call them, and they work at Tiger Credit Union as well as at Co-op Credit Union then after school, during breaks, during the summer. These students are trained and developed just as a full-time student is or a full-time employee and they are taught how to provide excellent service, how to live and show our core values as an organization, and then take those out once they leave high school. They may not get a job in a financial institution once they're out of high school, but the skills that they learn are very transferable and can be used anywhere. Our students are meeting regularly to make plans for Tiger Credit Union. We uh, hope to work with the marketing class, you know, the business classes to help us develop future marketing plans. And um, they work closely with adults from Co-op Credit Union. We always have an adult on site at the high school with the students and they tap into the resources and work right alongside with them. <coughs> so this partnership in Tiger Credit Union is really all about financial literacy. It is our passion and we don't promote products and services. We talk general financial skills. So we appreciate the opportunity we've had over the last three years to work in Black River Falls High School and look forward to the possibility of moving into the future with that. Okay, thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, we will take no action on um, this item tonight, but uh, it was just a discussion item, so thank you so much. We'll move on to student discipline. Do we want to talk about a timeline for when we would make a decision? Because oh, sure. um, I'm thinking that we're not sure. to know one way or the other. Would the board be comfortable with it being an action item for our March meeting? Yes. March be comfortable? Sure. Do, does anyone feel like we need to invite our guests back, or do you feel like you've asked all the questions that you have now? We were provided a good, um, good information in our packet as well with the history. So. It's an open for sure they can come. I just, yes. whether yeah. they... Yeah. It's open me. I don't think we would... to be invited versus required. That's yeah, I don't all. think I we would need so. another presentation. Okay. But, but thank you for coming. I just wanted okay. to be clear what your expectations are. Okay. So. Okay. If a, if a question were to pop up, Tell we me. can direct it through you. Okay. 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 Thank you. We'll move on to student discipline. Okay. So, um, I'm just taking a action item in here. Um, I was contacted by Justin Brown over a frustration with a situation at the high school. Um, I, he asked, his first request was to be put on the school board agenda. I explained to him that the school board does not engage in investigations of student matters. The school board directs me and Mr. Chambers to take care of that stuff. He was extremely adamant that he wanted to come and present to the school board and I recognized that A, it is a public meeting and he was not interested in being the public comment. He wanted an agenda item as opposed to public comment um, and I uh, recognize that you guys are always wanting to hear from the community as opposed to being um, perceived as closed to these discussions. I would just need to remind Justin again that it is absolutely not okay to use any other student name. You may not disclose any information about any student other than your own um, when you're talking because that would be a serious violation of that student's privacy. Um, we do have board policy that talks about a complaint procedure. Um, you chose not to go that route, which is fine, um, but if you were to choose to go through that procedure, it would go through me, who would do a full investigation, who would write you a written statement of my findings. You could either accept them, or if you did not, then all of my investigation stuff would go to the board, and then they would decide whether they were going to um, offer a closed session meeting where you could speak very freely, because um, it would be closed session to just um, those directly involved, and then other student names could be used. So I just want to be very clear that that Possibility is not closed to you, but this is an open public meeting and we need to protect all of the students' privacy. So, with okay. that. Good evening, members of the board. I'm here tonight to discuss the lack of disciplinary action taken by Mr. Chambers against a student who assaulted my daughter. On February 7th, I received a text message from my daughter that, quote, some girl just came up and punched me in the face three times, end quote. At the time, I was in class, so I told her to go to the office. 
After my class ended, I called to speak to Mr. Chambers, who was unavailable. So I was transferred to speak with the interim assistant principal. At th that time, the responding officer and Mr. Ken Manning were discussing the issue. I was told over the phone, which was on speaker at the time, that the student would receive batter battery and disorderly conduct citations. Later that day, I went to the high school and had a conversation with Mr. Chambers. He had been in meetings during the day and was still gathering information about the incident. The following morning, I returned to the school with my daughter. We sat down with Mr. Chambers to discuss the incident so he could hear her side of the story. My daughter told him that the offender had set her backpack down immediately when she approached her. She also informed Mr. Chambers that the offender had asked someone prior to record the incident on their phone. In my opinion, both of these actions clearly show the fact that this act of violence was premeditated. During our conversation, my daughter became vocal and upset because in her opinion, the punishment levied was insufficient. At that point, the offender had spent less than a full day in in-school suspension. She gave Mr. Chambers some more information to follow up on. I left feeling that once he was able to talk to some witnesses and review the video recording of the incident, he would have enough information to determine an appropriate course of action, including additional disciplinary actions. I also left feeling that his only concern was that he was dissatisfied with the way my daughter had spoken to him and that he had been trying to convince my daughter and I that less than a day of in-school suspension was sufficient punishment. Again on Friday, February 9th, I returned to the school to have a conversation with Mr. Chambers. Confident by that time, he would have had sufficient time to conclude his investigation of the matter. He informed me that he had viewed a recording taken by another student on a phone, but gave no further details. Prior to leaving, I told him I was far from satisfied with only a partial day of in-school suspension. It was agreed that he would call me to follow up Monday, February 12th. I have still not heard anything back from him. That same day, I called and spoke to Amy Hoffman and explained the situation. She informed me that individual school board members cannot take action and that if I would like to address the board as a whole, that was my right. I immediately called the district office to be added to the agenda for the upcoming board meeting. I was told by Marty Herz <clears throat> I was told that Marty Herzberg and Shelley Severson were the only two people who could add me to the agenda, but that they were both gone for the day. The following Monday, I called and spoke to Marty, who took my information and passed it along to Dr. Severson. Later that day, I received a call from Shelley and we discussed the incident. It was apparent to me that Shelley's main concern was moving forward from this point. She asked if I was okay with Sue lead home, talking with my daughter, and potentially having the two girls discuss their differences with Sue as a mediator. I told her that I, that would be fine. While I can understand and appreciate her concern for forward progress, this does not address the issue of minimal punishment for an act of physical violence. <clears throat> My daughter has been sick a couple days since that conversation with, Sully, with Shelley Severson, and between that and the days canceled due to the weather, this conversation between my daughter, her attacker, and Mrs. Leadholm has yet to happen to the best of my knowledge. Additionally, during my conversation with Dr. Severson, I informed her that I was well aware of another student who received five days of out-of-school suspension for a similar incident. There was no investigation, and the punishment was levied immediately. The parents were called and instructed to pick the student up immediately. This was her first offense. Dr. Severson went on to say that every situation is different and the details are considered when determining the punishment. The parents of the student are here tonight if you'd like, to <clears throat> like some clarification on that incident. According to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, school violence can cause more emotional harm than physical harm. The CDC also found that school violence can lead to alcohol and drug use, depression, anxiety, other psychological problems, including fear and suicide. In 2014, there were over 486,000 non-fatal violent victimizations at school among students 12 to 18 years of age. In the United States, suicide is the second leading cause of death for the age groups from 10 to 34, according to the CDC. 
When you are thinking about disciplinary actions for acts of violence, I would like you all to consider what would happen to a coworker if they committed an act of violence against you. <clears throat> Most employers have a zero tolerance policy towards physically aggressive acts against a coworker. I'm confident if such an event occurred where I work, the aggressive party's employment would be terminated. I understand by law the offender in this case is entitled to an education, but what message is being sent when the punishment is so minimal? This incident took place after advising while the students were on their way to their cl first class of the day. Later that, that day there was an assembly and the offender was allowed to attend because the speaker's message was important and relevant in the principal's opinion. The period of time spent in ISS is about five hours when you consider when the incident occurred, the time spent with the officer, and the fact that the student went to an assembly. As stated originally, I am here tonight to discuss the lack of disciplinary action taken against a student who committed an act of physical violence against my daughter. Five hours of in-school suspension is unjust and unacceptable. Thank you, Mr. Bone. Um, does anyone have any questions for Mr. Bone? Should we direct any, uh, Tom? Mr. Chambers, would you like to we address? We can't discuss the details yeah, of the I know. case, okay. so I'm not okay. sure what we well, would be I, I want, to do. Well, I want to share with you um, our board policy, um, and, and maybe you've looked at that already, but this is a, this is a paper copy. Normally, what we would do is go through, um, <coughs> for the investigation, it would be um, most likely Dr. Severson, who wasn't involved in the specific incident. Um, to in, do an investigation, report back to us, as she said, and then allow um, the, the parties to agree or disagree and, and come back for a closed session with the board on that. So you understand this, we, no action is going to be taken tonight yep. on that. So, okay. okay. Do any board members have questions? Or? Could, could you talk a little bit about the assembly? What was, what was the topic of the assembly? So John Norlin was the speaker. Um, he, I don't know if you remember that um, Character Strong Leadership Group that uh, we went to out of the lacrosse area last year. They sponsored him coming back from Washington State to go to the school districts to speak for a free assembly for those that are involved in their Character Strong. And so they called us and said, we're flying John Norlin back. Um, we've got an afternoon available. Are you interested? And so I asked the other adults that were part of the Character Strong training, and they were very, very, very interested. It linked to um, the previous day on the announcements. There was a public service announcement about um, because I said I would, and it was a whole idea of students following through on their word, and um, they had little cards printed out that I'm going to, and then they could write whatever that message was, and then in the bottom of the card said, because I said I would, and so they felt like the assembly was a very um, strong follow-up to that public service announcement about being um, uh, a good citizen to your neighbors and how you treat people and you do the right thing because you said you're going to, and because, I mean, it was, it was character education is basically what it was. Um, was were the police involved in this? You they said? were. Okay. Okay. Yes. Can you explain again to me about the videotaping? They had the, how that worked. So you know, kids have their phones everywhere. So um, the girl who assaulted my daughter had asked a friend of her to record the altercation, meaning that she knew she was going to do something prior to the incident occurring. That was recorded on a cell phone. And Mr. Chambers has seen the video. I have not. The, the depth of an investigation will include what led up to, you know, what kind of interactions happened before this. I mean, it could get very lengthy. So it would be our board's policy to go ahead and um, direct Dr. Severson to do an investigation. I'm totally fine with that. However, I don't think there's any act leading up to it that can justify Okay. Physical aggression. Well, and that and that will, um, through the investigation, those um, opinions will be <clears throat> agree with you or disagree with you, or, or and and we'll come back and review that. In so, the end, the board would make that yeah. decision if they yeah. if they felt the consequence 
uh, was appropriate for the incident. In the end, that would become their decision then. I, I would just like to point out one thing, your, your comment about an employer, a um, uh, place of employment would never tolerate that. You're absolutely right, but you know what? Not everyone has to have a job. We are public education and we must open our doors to every single student okay. that wants to come here. And, and so that and is I made a, that point in my statement. It just makes a significant difference if you have the right to select the best and brightest that you want to work for you, knowing that any <coughs> act of uh, that doesn't align with the vision and mission of your dis your um, business, you have the right to uninvite them <laughs> to be a part of it. That is an extremely different standard than what public schools are. And I'm not justifying. I'm simply saying that is a piece that we battle with a great deal. Every child is guaranteed by law that we must provide services for them. So I, I, I don't say that to sway anything. I just need everyone to remember that. You're absolutely right. I wouldn't tolerate that by a staff member. You're absolutely right. But I don't have to. Everyone who works for us isn't guaranteed by law their job. And so it just really is extremely different when we talk about an employer versus um, and the safety of our, our students are our prime concern here, so feel assured it will be um, investigated fully. And so there is actually a timeline that is included in that policy, as you will see from tonight when the, it is 10 days that I have to do the investigation. And so what I do is I give it to you, and you and I have a conversation about it after those 10 days. If you are satisfied, great. If you are not satisfied, and by the way, when I say I do an investigation, I may decide to do something different than what was done, or I may not, but uh, you and I, you will know all of what I know after that conversation. You can either be pleased and satisfied with that or not. And if you are not, by policy, all of my investigation information goes to the board members. And it, it's a unique policy. I just reread it before the meeting. Um, if two of the board members contact the president and say, I, I'd like to know more about this, two or more, and then they would schedule a closed session meeting in which you would be invited to so that you could engage in the detailed conversation that you have been given and that they have been given. So the conversation at least is from um, a similar knowledge base, if that makes sense, that everyone has access to that information. Do you have any more to say then? Um, thank you, Mr. Brown, and thank you for abiding by the rules of not saying the students' names. Yep. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. The next, um, the high school graduation date of 2019. And so as you shared with me last month, you would prefer that or this become part of the calendar, and so I will do that moving forward. But the high school is recommending June 9th, 2019 as the graduation date for the class of 2019. We have several in this room who so have a graduate in that year, don't we? June 9th, 2019. I don't mean to interrupt, but I thought with Mr. Brown's comment getting switched on the agenda that it would still be an open forum for people to comment on his. I didn't know that public speaking was at the beginning because I would have spoken well, before he did. Okay, we're in a regarding this, yeah. This we're meeting. here to do board business and um, for the board members for correct. An open I was open involved meeting. with his. Such, I'm the parent to the daughter, to where I just wanted to comment and elaborate to his. To where I'm I would have sure spoken public. Do that. It's, it's student discipline. Yeah. You didn't put a person's name attached to it, so it would be Correct. up to you to decide. I it. thought it was public. Mm -hmm. I, is all. So, I don't want uh, to yes and no. No, no, but yes and no. Let me just give you a little. Student discipline is the um, board agenda item, and I understand that you would. I understand that you would like to talk on student discipline. I just want to correct you that at no point is board business a public forum. Correct. But your speaking is what I was saying. Did you already cover that at the beginning? Yep. Where let me, I let me finish. I promise. I promise. Okay. That's okay. I'm trying. Um, what you are asking for is, could you also make a comment about student Correct. discipline when you say public forum? That implies to me that it's a free for all and everyone oh, gets you. And okay. and so the. Board president, right. the board president can call on anyone to speak at that time. And so right. you are correct. When uh, Mr. Brown started to stand up under public comment, I said, actually, I have that on the agenda yeah. under student discipline, which would, yep, okay. yep, okay. I understand that. So I didn't know if I was still able to at all. Well, uh, I under, it was my understanding that Mr. Brown had requested to, to talk. Um, I will give you the opportunity to make a comment about student discipline. Okay, thank and, you. Um, I wasn't planning on speaking, but I am Jenny Fisher. Um, Corey and I have four students in the district. We use two pages 21. Okay, no, no names, no names. Oh, my, my children. Oh. 
They're her children. She can announce her children. But, but I thought you were going to talk about another situation. I just situation. wanted to tell you, I am the parent to Caitlin Fisher. Then I have four children. And, Caitlin is oh. one of my students who, um, a boy at the high school was talking sexual comments about her. And instead of waiting for him to approach her, she went to him, confronted him about these comments. He verbally got a little vulgar with her, and she punched him. So she is the one that got an altercation. I'm not saying she's right or wrong, but she is the one that got five days suspension right then and there that day. Within an hour, within a half hour, we were called to come pick her up. So I am just commenting on Mr. Brown's situation, and I do agree with Shelly where everything is different. But when you look at the scenarios, it uh, was not premeditated. Caitlin was not the aggressor by any means, but when she got vulgarly, and I don't know, can I tell you what he was saying at, that he was going to do to her in the basement of the high you're, school? You're not yeah. asking us to yeah. do an investigation I just, that situation, so I'm, just so saying I'm not like, sure so what relevance I, that would It was so vulgar where I, I yeah. don't yeah. condone her actions either, but I see where some things have to stop. But in comparison to the student discipline, I'm just looking at five day suspension for somebody who did not premeditate, didn't videotape, didn't ask anybody to do it prior, wasn't set up to fight, and somebody else five hours in school suspension, what is the difference? I don't I don't know that if it's gender, they both were female. The difference is white or not, I don't they're know. They're in sports and she's native. Okay. And I will say it right off. No, we're all thinking. Could you please okay. identify yourself? I'm Corey Fisher. Fisher. This is my wife. Caitlin's my daughter. My only concern is we are a zero tolerance policy at the school. I thought whether employer at or at school, everybody deserves free education. But I, I just need the unfairness underneath the student discipline to be recognized. And as far as the, I, I was just a little appalled that your peer and your citizenship, you would allow somebody who just attacked somebody to represent Blackover with that. Because my daughter's got to watch the attacker up there acting so modelist citizenship for Blackover Falls. So that was another slap in the face, I guess. So I just want you to be aware of that, that my students And again, to school. please know that we, we don't know the situations, no, we don't I know, know the so names. And, and we we understand you don't know. Okay. What we're here to, to let you know is that we have a, a, a situation where our daughter basically did the same thing. She was kicked out of school immediately that morning for five days. Okay. Then you have a native who's on a sports team, does the same thing, gets five hours of in-school suspension, Video attends a uh, role model, whatever it was, role model citizenship. and is allowed back in school the very next day. Not only that, she had her friend videotape it, proving she was going there to cause harm to somebody. Okay, That's I, ridiculous. Well, that's all that's why we're here. Okay, and, and we've made the decision that we're going to move ahead with investigation um, to include um, the you know, preceding things and I appreciate your comments. I just want the your... board to know okay. about our situation because okay. it is unfair. Okay. My student, uh, Caitlin, has never been in trouble before with anything. Um, so this was her first incident, and it was regarding a boy who was going to attack her supposedly sexually at the high school. That's where she okay. confronted him yes. first. Yes, you said that. So, okay. Okay. Does thank anybody you. have any questions? So I would happily answer anything. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Okay. One more. Yes, please come yeah, forward. And identify yourself as well. My name is Ross Goldsmith. I also have two students at the Black Falls High School. Um, my one question is I've heard zero tolerance thrown out tonight, and I've also heard that each situation is handled differently. You've not heard zero tolerance from any school staff members, just okay. to be clear. That is clear. That is correct. Okay, but which is it? That is my question to the school board. Is it all right for a student to start a fight or isn't it? And if each situation is different, what does the school board list as criteria so we as parents can understand those rules as they're laid out? Because if 
I'm understanding the situation correctly. Three punches in the face, one punch in the face, five hours in school suspension, five days out of school suspension. What does it take to get it through a student's head that this is not acceptable? I mean, does one student have to be lying bleeding on the floor? Or is it one that the videotape wasn't good enough, we need two next time, so we get both angles? I, I, I'm concerned at that level that there is even a situation, that each situation is handled differently. Each situation is handled differently, I believe is how it was worded. Correct? But if no two situations are exactly alike. Okay, thank yeah, you. And, and that includes the history leading up to that and um, a lot of different facts that the investigation would, would bring out as well. So each, in, each situation is a different situation. And I know, Mr. Goldsmith, you want to know what the board's policy is on that. And I think we're all very concerned with school yes. safety. Yes. And we knew nothing about any of this before. And I'm sure that we will talk and be very interested in this. And, and there's a reason for that. So if it does come to the board level, nobody has heard um, pr sure. prior knowledge of anything to make an opinion. So this is the way um, our board governance is to, to not receive <coughs> details about incidences. So, so thank you for bringing it forward and we will um, pursue with an investigation. Thank you. <coughs> Is there anyone else? Okay, um, now did we didn't have to act on graduation date. We do and we oh, stopped right when we announced okay. the date. <coughs> the recommendation. It didn't have the action on here. So, so I do okay. need to vote. Oh, I'm okay. Sorry. Okay, the motion to have a June 9th, 2019 graduation date. Thank you. Um, all in favor say yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Motion carried. Community Engagement and Board Committee Report. No, no sorry. Not no meeting? Okay. Okay, we'll move on to employment recommendations, and we have a few of those. If there are no, recommend, or no employment um, things that you need to take action on, but just uh, information for you. Um, we are... Um, sad to lose Pam Wade at the high school. She's been, she's our only four, is that? Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, they are the ones that do the bulk of the ordering and the, they head up all the catering and our food service does such a great job with that. Um, Pam has been here for boy, eight years maybe, seven, eight years, um, but their family is relocating and so she was sad to leave us, sad to see her go, um, but uh, we have hired Laurel Larson to take that on and so um, you can see there's been some movement in our special education aid and bus drivers. Um, you'll note the two new bus drivers, they both have been substitute drivers for the district for a while and so it is nice when we can take people who have already been through all the training and, and they are rewarded with a full-time position after um, doing the job of subbing for a while. So again, no action is needed, but just yeah. informing you. Okay, thank you. Under student success now, we'll move on to strategic plan review. So, yep, I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, mid-year star data, um, and then Mr. Dobbs and Mr. Stanley are going to talk about, um, if you recall, the SAGE rules, instead of being SAGE, it's AGR, Achievement Gearing. Gap reduction, thank you. I was gonna say guarantee, but it's not. She'd make gap reduction, because it should be a guarantee. That's why that always jumps in there. Um, and so they're gonna talk a little bit because one of their requirements for reporting is that they give a media report to the board. So they will be coming next. So what I have in front of you looks a little bit different than what we've looked at before. We usually look at starting from the beginning of the year to the end of that year, what kind of growth we experienced. But if you remember in our strategic plan goals, we talk about from spring of one year to spring to the next year. And part of that rationale is because um, we experience um, pretty much every year a uh, pretty significant summer learning loss and so by measuring spring to spring we won't artificially see a lot of growth that didn't really exist there and so um, why it looks a little different is because I wanted to show you all of the so if you were thinking of our old charts that were red yellow blue green and dark green these right here would all be the dark green on the very, very top. Those are all those that are 90th percentile and higher. And so this would be spring of 2017, so their previous grade level. This would be fall of this year, and then this would be mid of this current year. And so this would be the section that was green in the past. You can see the summer learning loss. It was interesting that we didn't lose any of our students that were 
let me take that back. I was talking with Christy Roche, who is our Gifted and Talented Coordinator, and she said, I was just looking at the middle school data, and I'm so disappointed that some of my kids that were above uh, grade level um, aren't there anymore. How come we don't have any kids above the 90th? And I said, but we do. Our numbers are almost the same. It's different kids. So some kids that were scoring up in the 90s uh, have fallen below, but other kids have taken their spot. Of course, our goal would be to bring all of them and sustain it, but so this would have been the dark green on the old charts. This is the at benchmark, meaning they are at the 50th percentile or higher. Um, and again, this was last spring, end of year, uh, fall, and then our winter testing window was the end of January. This is on watch. This is from the 20th percentile to the 50th percentile. Um, remember, that's not percentage, it's percentile. So 50th percentile is right exact in the middle, um, just to remember that. So this would be that on watch group. The more conversations we've had with staff, this is the group that we really want to see some movement in. We've worked so hard over the last couple of years to build up our, our pyramid of interventions for our yellow kids and our red kids, but this group in the middle is just knocking on the door to being at or above that 50th percentile. And so we have structures in place for these kids that are urgent intervention. Um, you can see uh, the kind of jumping around here, and that makes good sense that some of our lowest kids that needed urgent intervention experienced the greatest loss during the summer and so after half a year instruction they're back to where they were at the end of last year. So we have systems in place for these kids, it's these kids that that core classroom instruction um, need to meet their needs and so um, this first chart was is it math gym? Uh, reading I think, yep that was reading so then we'll scroll down to math is next. Same thing, this would have been that dark green on top. This would be the uh, 50th percentile to 90th. This is that blue group, um, the yellow group, and the red group. Um, so same comparisons. If you recall, uh, when we used to go grade by grade, there were very few grades that had kids consistently scoring um, above the 90th percentile. And I would say every grade level has a nice population of kids um, that are scoring in that range. Um, Again, a pretty significant swing in this group. It certainly looks like some of these kids that came in in the fall with some summer loss bumped up to being above the 50th um, after half a year instruction. Um, our percentage down here, if you remember the RTI pyramid, it says that 80 to 85 percent of their kids are getting their needs, needs met in that general instruction. And so our goal would be that adding these two together would be between 15 and 20 percent. So you look nine and nine, we're 18%, 13 and 10 were above, and then 7 and 11, so we'd be at about 18%. So again, that is the RTI py pyramid, 80 to 85% of your kids getting their needs met through core instruction. Our focus really has to be on these blue kids getting them over the hump um, towards proficiency. Any questions on that data? As far as the rest of the strategic plan, I just sent out the staff feedback survey. Um, and then I sent out the parents' feedback survey right after the kids didn't have school for six days. And so I almost felt like on Wednesday I should call and say, Hi, it's Dr. Severson calling again. Does your kid remember how to get to school? Because it just so happened that the bad weather came after Thursday in service, Friday, no school. And um, that happens more often than not that bad weather follows already scheduled days off. So it was a long stretch of, of time there. So. Any questions about the, oh, so that is the rest of the strategic plan data. Those surveys are all out, and when I sent it out, um, the parent survey, somebody emailed me back right away, we're just glad you're taking our kids today, so <laughs> fantastic, <laughs> we're glad to have them. Um, and so that data will be available um, by the March meeting, we'll start um, dissecting all of that feedback surveys that we get. And um, this year we're making a concerted effort to get more feedback from the students. Red Creek Middle School and High School, we do the student surveys, and we've gotten a pretty low return rate on those because we were invitational about it, and so we talked today at admin how we can be more open Hey everybody, open up your laptop, here's the link, take the survey, it's 10 questions, this is important information we need to know from you. So we are going to make a more concerted effort to get feedback from the students this year. This is so great to have this current information so you can respond immediately. I remember the day when you had to wait six months to get it. <laughs> you know, well, if we go by our quarterly yes. exam that everyone has to take, they will yeah. take that test in the, March. This is great and that you got this. next October, yeah. we'll know how the kids did. Yeah. 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 So, I, I just had a technical question. Yes. So the green is the end of last year. Yep. So what we did is this is consistent with spring. I thought green and spring would like resonate with somebody. And then fall, I thought school spirit orange was. <laughs> so, so my question then, 
is the benchmark different from fall to fall? From fall, to fall? They are normed a little bit differently. So if you log in to take that test and you are currently, uh, they do it by month. So I am a 4.9 fourth grader. I mean, I'm a fourth grade ninth month. Here's what the proficiency levels are. And then when they come in the fall, I am a 5.1. So there is a proficiency level difference there. Mm -hmm. Yep. It, it definitely progresses by year and by month. Um, interestingly, um, the biggest jumps are at the lower levels between first and second grade. The gap is about this big. And then after you get up any further than that, they really even out. So it's almost even spaces between each of the grade levels. But to go from a 1.1 reading level to a 2.1 reading level is really a huge jump. Any other questions about that? Elementary principles. Achievement gap reduction, no guarantee in words. Okay, Rick and I are gonna share a little information on the achievement gap reduction. Just to give you a, a little recap on what Dr. Severson said. This is the replacement for what used to be called the SAGE grant. We used to have where class sizes had to be at 18 or under for like K through three. So they come up with a, a new way of uh, funding schools under the achievement gap reduction. But to qualify for it, you have to f abide by some different guidelines. Okay, so there's three different stipulations you could use to qualify for the achievement gap reduction. One is a class size under 18. One is to have an, another one would be to have an instructional coach on staff that services serve services your teaching staff, or the other option would be have one-on-one uh, -on -one tutoring for your students. So we have a kind of a menagerie of combinations for each gra grade level to qualify for the grant um, because it's unpredictable, you know, how large our classes are going to be from year to year, from grade to grade. So it gives us a little bit of leeway on how we use our resources and so forth to. Uh, to make this grant happen, so that's a good thing. So I'm gonna kind of go through real quick with uh, kindergarten and first grade, um, where we're at, I guess, with um, our goals with the grant and uh, uh, and how the kids have grown so far to this point, and then I'll show you, in the chart, I'll kind of show you what we use to um, satisfy the grant with our, I guess, those criteria, okay? So, in kin yeah, kin well, that's scroll up. The middle button is the pointer. Okay. Start reading a map. Oops. There. Okay, right there is fine. All right, so if you notice, and this is just a reporting form that we got from the DPI that uh, the, gra the graphs are nicer to look at. I get that, but this is what they suggested for us to use because we've got a space in here that we'll fill out for when we do get our spring data as well in the what's not available. So in kindergarten, um, we have seven, our goal was 70% of our students will reach their growth goal for reading as determined by STAR Early Literacy. That's the standardized test we use in kindergarten and in first grade. It's not quite the same as STAR Reading that Rick uses over in, in uh, Red Creek, it's, but it's real similar. It's uh, developmentally appropriate for our kids um, it's for that age level. So 70% of our kids will reach their goal, goal. When we tested at the beginning of the year, we had 57% of our kids were already at benchmark. So that was a good thing you know, to have a significant amount of kids at benchmark to kick off the kindergarten year. But by mid-year, we've grown, what's that saying is we've grown to 70% of the kids are at benchmark by mid-year point, okay? And how we did that, obviously a lot of instruction and a lot of hard work, that kind of stuff. But we had class sizes under, under 18 in kindergarten, and we also utilized instructional coaching. Ms. Eberhardt's our instructional coach at, at uh, the Forest Street, who does a lot of professional development with our staff to uh, make good things happen in the classroom. So that's where we're at for reading for kindergarten. For math, we have a 70% growth goal for math as well. And you'll see that those numbers are the same because for kindergarten, they don't separate out math and they don't separate out reading out of this test. It's all lumped together, okay? The literacy uh, standards are all, with, all come out in one, one piece. We can break them down by standards and look at them and dissect math from reading and draw some instructional conclusions from them. But when they report it out, it's all together. So it's the same thing, 57% to 70%, and we've got the same criteria that we use for kindergarten. Okay? Just oh, scroll down. <laughs> I'm not pointing at you. I'm trying to get it over. <laughs> You're pointing at me. <laughs> Bounce it off. <laughs> All right. So for first grade, in reading, we use the same goal, 70% criteria is what we want. We started off with 46% of our kids 
in first grade reading were at benchmark. We've grown that to almost 54% of our kids at benchmark. Our class sizes are a little bit bigger in uh, first grade, so we don't, we're not under the 18, but we do in, utilize instructional coaching. And in first grade, remember, we do have reading recovery, which is a one-on-one -on -one tutoring program that we utilize with uh, a significant amount of kids. We have tried to run two rounds of that to target the lower kids and give them some extra help in, in reading. So that's in there as well. Uh, for math in first grade, we do have a separate taf test for math. It's called STAR Math for first grade. It doesn't, it doesn't fall into STAR Early Literacy, even though we can use some of the data from that. But we used STAR Math, and we had 45% of the kids at benchmark at the start of the year, and we grew to 61% at mid-year. So that was really nice growth there. We are pretty happy with that. And we used instructional coaching there as well, and one-on-one -on -one tutoring uh, for math as well. So. And currently the class sizes in K-1 are 18 or lower, is that accurate? Correct. Yep. So just well, in kindergarten, not first grade. First grade we have a 19? Yeah, we have some, yeah. Okay. Yep, some 19. So it's not, yep, I just not over the to top it. large. I just, just to be aware. That's yep, all. real close to around that 18, but it was just, we don't qualify for in first grade. That's because we're hair over in class size. So that's it for Forest Street. Does anybody have any questions about Forest Street? All right, thanks. Yep. All right, good evening. Um, second grade and third grade, we do use the STAR test, and our measure for growth is a little bit different. We use a, a SGP, it's a student growth percentile. Um, real quick, what that is, is I start at a 2.1, like Shelly said. Everybody in the nation that's at that same level, you're a percentile rank in there, how much they grow. So the uh, STAR had a uh, recommend a goal of 35 for that percentile rank. Um, but as we look at the title of this grant, it's the Achievement Reduction Grant, so, uh, or gap, gap, gap reduction. We don't yes. want to reduce achievement. Not a grant. We don't want to reduce the grant. <laughs> Long day. Uh, achievement gap reduction. So we wanted to uh, be more aggressive with our goals, and so we uh, this year bumped that up to 50. So I kind of showed you where we would have been at the 35, our old goal, which Star recommended, and then where we're at with the 50. So it is a more aggressive goal, um, but for good reason. And, and you know we want the bar high for our kids, and so this is where we set it for that. So uh, we do have a goal of getting 70% of our kids to have that growth goal. Um, as you can see, second grade reading, 58%, second grade math, 66%. Um, third grade is kind of right about in the same category, 55% of third graders on track, and uh, 42 uh, third grade math. So what do we do with that? We're not quite at our goal with that. Um, that's where the nice thing about this, where class size was the only criteria we had, having an instructional coach is a big part of that. Um, with our instructional coaches, I know Stephanie Briggins been digging in really hard with our instructional coaches, leading that charge, really looking at the, uh, what are the things that we can do to improve, and so some really targeted professional development with our teachers. Um, that's really one of the powerful things about having that coach and having someone like Stephanie on board to really uh, guide that instruction. So uh, we uh, have uh, grade level and individual meetings with teachers to really dig in and uh, where we're at with each of our individual kids. Um, so we're, we're not quite there yet. This is our mid-year little litmus test. Um, but again, it's a much more aggressive goal this year. Teachers are asking, are you going to raise it to 60 or 70 next year? No, I think we're, uh, 50 is a good aggressive goal for us, um, and it really raises the bar. And so I, I'm excited about that, and the teachers are digging in our, but this is uh, where we are at. We do have some classes at 18, some that are at like 19, so, um, and we don't really have the one-on-one -on -one tutoring per se like they do at Forest Street. Our, we do have some three to four to one, but uh, mostly the coaching is our, our big thing we use. So, if you have questions? Reading recovery is not in, no. it's first grade only. It's first, first grade, grade only. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. And we have other interventionists at uh, Fort, at Red Creek, but they don't do one-to-one -one tutoring. The only one-to-one -one strictly program is the reading recovery. And so, but they meet the um, criteria because they have the instructional coaches. Correct. Yeah. All right. Thank, Thank you. That was their building report as well, by the way. <laughs> cool. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs>
Okay, and so we move on to Jobs for America graduates. Sure, so I don't know if any of you are familiar with JAG is what it's called. It's Jobs for America's graduates. I just pulled this off of their website to share with you as some information. We had a speaker um, come to one of our admin meetings and talked a lot to us about the benefits of a JAG program and what it could do for our students. And to be honest, I didn't get it because um, apparently I didn't have my good listening ears on that day. Um, but there are only two JAG programs in the state of Wisconsin and Toma is one of them and um, Sun Prairie has a J program that is entirely part of an alternative school so it's not in their high school it's alternative so Mr. Chambers and I went down to Toma and spent a couple hours in their J classroom and I left there so incredibly pleased and impressed that um, I have an appointment with them this Friday or next Friday they're coming to see us so here's here's what it is um, jobs for America's graduates they come into a district I'll tell you the way the Toma one is set up, and that is not how it has to be, but that's how Toma does it. They have a teacher who is a full-time staff member who is paid for by Jobs for America's graduates. They sign an agreement with the district that that teacher looks like, acts like, feels like a staff member from that district, but is completely funded from this external <coughs> source. Um, Toma has gotten to the point after this many years, they contribute $10,000 each year to the JAG program. But the rest of supplies and travel and um, teacher salary all comes from this group. They have lots of business partners that they go to that those business partners fund the program in the schools. And so what does that program look like? The JAG teacher has um, four different classes during her day. She has a freshman class, a sophomore class, a junior class, and a senior class. We got to visit the senior class. What they use it for is if you are a freshman and you are suddenly failing two, three classes, they will talk to you about dropping one of those <coughs> classes and they put you in JAG for one period of your day. You can get a partial elective credit for JAG, so it's not like you're going to become more credit deficient by being in that classroom. You can get an elective credit for it. Um, and what that person acts like, truly the best way to describe it is, it's like a parenting nag person right in the school with the student. And so that Jade teacher follows those kids around with a, that was due yesterday, where is it? Pull out your notebook, you're going to that class right now, take this with you and go turn this in. What do you mean you didn't get that? And you, you know, they'll call home, that permission slip needs to be signed. And so they really are acting as um, an advisor on steroids for those kids in that program. Then the sophomores, they have, there's a curriculum at each one of those levels as well. And because it is funded by many businesses, it is employability skills a great deal. For example, the day that we were there, each of the seniors put together, every one of the seniors was in a work-based learning um, program. Several of them already had been offered employment by their work-based learning um, program upon graduation, and it was the end of first semester. Um, there's one that is in a youth apprenticeship that their work base that they got figured out is going to pay for them to go get schooling and trained and then is guaranteed that student a job because they've had such a positive experience. The thing that was overwhelming um, from those students was the sense of pride that they took in the work that they're doing and it to them they all said it that their JAG group felt like a surrogate family for them at school but what they appreciated was that the expectations in that room were so high. They felt like they were part of this elite club getting to be a part of JAG. And then JAG also would fund like some speakers in the school. And so these kids that were pretty disengaged, because let's be honest, if you're failing multiple classes, it's probably not an academic problem. It's probably an engagement with school problem. And so they loved it that they were part of the program that is hosting this assembly. And so they got to be you know, a part of that and, and whatever. Um, but when we got there, each one of the kids came up to Mr. Chambers and myself and eye contact, hands out, shook our hands, greeted us to their classroom. They had <coughs> snacks for us first thing in the morning. I mean, they are about employability skills a great deal. And so they each had to give us a presentation and they, um, I asked them, so how many of you are involved in anything else within the school? Because I feel like engagement also means you're involved in something else. And there was one Two kids who are athletes, there's one, um, she's got a 3.8 GPA, she's going to UW-Madison next year, and um, but she needed that extra support uh, while she was at school. Um, there was a couple that were in band or choir, there was some forensic speakers, so it really was, it felt to me like it, it was an alternative school, 
but it was in their high school as opposed to our current model of alternative school which is pulled out of our high school. We say sometimes when we put a kid into an alternative setting that the goal is to reintegrate them into the high school and they want to be there but we have yet to be successful in that drive. Um, they are doing it because the kids don't ever leave. They're getting their needs met through this JAG program um, and then are able to be successful in their other classes. And, and I asked myself, if you guys wouldn't mind sharing your definition of success, would you mind sharing what your current GPAs are? Because, again, eligible to graduate and a GPA, you know, is not always. And um, all of them were able to say, boy, it's really gone up since I've been in JAG, and so I pushed even further. What does up mean? Like, 0.9 is more than 0.7, but is that celebratory or not? And, and most of the kids there had above a 2.0. There was quite a few 2.5s, and there was that one with a 3.8 who was going to Madison. So they really seemed to me like they were engaging in the work. So what does this mean? We know that we are always in a budget reduction mode. How can we possibly do this? They are interested in doing fundraising <coughs> on our behalf. They talk to their um, uh, business partners and because the uh, Toma superintendent and principal came and talked to us at the end and I, the superintendent said, so why wouldn't somebody do this? And I go, I don't mean to be dumb, but if it's that good of a deal, why is there only two programs That's in the right, state, right? <laughs> like why are there only two? I don't get it. And they said, you have to be invited to be a part of it. Oh. And I'm like, so what of our demographics made us look so desirable that they wanted to work with us? And our proximity to Toma was a draw because they already have a very successful program in Toma. But they also said that um, the diversity and the poverty level that we have um, and the size of our community because they can't go to small rural rural districts because there's not the industry possibilities for the, all the job placements and all that stuff. So I'm not asking for any action tonight. At some point I may be. I wanted you to be informed that I'm going to have that next meeting with them and talk about what possibilities might exist. I know the board is very conscientious. You don't want anyone going to our local business partners asking for handouts on our behalf. And so um, they would need your approval before they could take that next step. But they talked about some of their national partners. I, it was AT&T is a huge partner and McDonald's Courtesy Corps is a huge, huge supporter of them on a national level and so um, it's an exciting opportunity if we can make it happen another staff member to help with those kids that just need um, Charlie who are they? Who is it? It's Jay. Uh, it is a uh, Jobs for America's graduates so they've got a board of directors there's it's a the Wisconsin Courtesy Corps is what you wrote on the thing yeah. I'm just wondering who sponsors it and who's involved with it, you know, where the money comes from. Mm -hmm. The corporate sponsors, 100%. And so she would eventually, if we decided to move forward, she would definitely come and do a presentation to the board. I just wanted you to be informed that I'm having that next conversation with them before we get to that level. So, so there's talk. Oh, sure, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, if you scrolled up a little bit, the only thing, I mean, it sounds great, um, and engagement is a thing, but there was something here that said but it didn't really matter in the long run, and maybe I misread it. Um, Did I scroll too far? No, I don't know. I'll, I'll have, I'll, I, it isn't important today, but I'll, I'll try to. Okay. Because yeah. I thought, well, it should be outcomes based. What's the outcome of this? Yep. And so they have monitored their graduation rate and, and the GPA of kids that started as freshmen failing multiple classes and what their ending GPA was. And they, so they've done some of that internal monitoring. Um, but like I said, then the Sun Prairie one looks totally different because it is an alternative program entirely, and JAG is a component of that alternative program. So sure. JAG um, isn't the alternative program. It is a component of something that they've already created. And Sun Prairie is a huge district, and so that alt ed um, is just a much bigger place. So does Toma have other alternative education programs, or are yeah. those? They do. So they just pick certain kids that would fit into JAG. Correct. And and so they this lady, um, their JAG teacher, and, and this is a program that I feel the person makes the program for sure. Getting the right individual in there that kids want to engage with is absolutely colossal. Um, JAG supports training for that teacher 12 months out of the year, not just during the school year. They really invest heavily in those people that become those JAG teachers. And um, again, they pay the salary their their employee. But um, you asked me something else. Uh, Toma. Uh, I just asked about alternative programs. Yep. That... Toma has a program very similar to our Renaissance program. Okay. Um, and so they have all their, they have two programs, yeah. We have two as well. So they're so This is entirely different. 
entirely different because these kids would be in our high school. Oh, I know what I was going to say. She goes to eighth grade, um, kids that are chronically failing in eighth grade, and she encourages them as freshmen to sign up for JAG as freshmen right away so that we don't wait to fail first. We transition into the high school successful right away. So that was the part I was trying to remember. Well, it certainly goes along with our college and um, technical education yeah. initiatives and employability skills. I mean, it looks like so. We'll look forward to hearing more about your meeting. So okay. just wanted you to know that I was talking Thank to you. them before okay. they represent us in any way, shape, or form. Okay. So. Student success. Did they meet this month? Yeah. No. Okay. 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 You received the monthly expenditures in your packet. Does anyone want any of those brought out for discussion or questions? Okay. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Sorry, who seconded? Patty. 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 All in favor say yes. 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 Opposed. Motion carried. Wisconsin Taxpayer Alliance Comparison. All right. This is a large document. It looks like Joe's having trouble getting the picture. Oh, I, yes. This is. This is so good. This is so good. This was so good. I really good. enjoyed yeah, this thank one. You and for, I give it to you yeah. every year, and I just think it's, yes, it's good information yeah. to have. So, um, Scroll in there. I added the highlighting and then I figured out the average because I just think it's always nice to look at the average. So this first one I can read to you if her box is in the way there. Um, this is uh, just the percent minority across our CISA. Remember our CISA is comprised of 26 different schools. You can see them all listed here. Whoop. You could see them all listed there. <laughs> <laughs> and so the average percent of um, Minority population is 15.4 for our 26 uh, areas. Um, we are at 30.5 is our current um, minority population. Next, we're going to go through them kind of quickly. Um, the next is percent disabled. What that means is students who are officially have an IEP, they have been designated as special education. Our percentage is 13.3, the average is 14%. As you can see, it's really all over the map, um, but average is 14 there. If you want to stop and slow down on any of these, let me know. This one is the adjusted gross income, and so this is the family income. Um, we are at 42. Cool. 712 and the average is 45625. You can see this is us with a little bit of yellow and um, just for point of reference, independence is this next taller one and Onalaska is the real tall one, um, West Salem being the next one. And so that really just means that their percentage of free and reduced would be significantly less than that. drop into your chair there. <laughs> the next one is the property value per student in thousands and so Black River Falls is at 505 um, the average is 473 um, that comes with each year that uh, assessed uh, valuation um, again I don't know if I preface it but this is the Wisconsin Taxpayers Alliance that collects this data so it is not any educational institution that collects it it's the Wisconsin Taxpayers Alliance we get a customized report of our CESA schools I'm certain if you wanted one for the whole state we could request it this is one that they send us free so property value per student this one right up here living on the river would be Alma that is so property rich over here um, way over on the other side um, some of the taller ones that's Waniwak um, the next one is on Alaska um, so some of the taller ones but the average 473 we're at 505 this one is the total expenditures per student um, and so it is important to note that food service and community service dollars are excluded remember food service is its own funding account and community service is its own funding so this is just really the fun 10 budget is what this would be um, Black River Falls is at there 13,165 um, and our CESA average is 13,192. That was the 2016-17 budgeted, not the actual. Um, so you can see this would include our referendum spending and so that is why it looks slightly higher because we are also um, expending the, um, using the, paying back the debt for the referendum is included in that. Next. Then there's a comparative expenditures per student. This one they do it and they call it, um, 
compared to? There you go. There we go. Um, they say that this is education related spending, and so sometimes districts with small number of students but large land area have high uh, transportation costs. That is definitely us. We are very geographically large, and so we have large transportation costs. Um, we are at 11,054, and the average is 10,958, and so that would include transportation. Um, it does include uh, one time money on capital expenses, that kind of stuff. But, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the capital expenses are not included in here. Neither is transportation, actually. Just there's a small number for the comparative. Because oh, they want to take all of that. Sorry, variable. sorry. And so this is education related expenses. Thank you. Okay. The next one is student to teacher ratios, and so this first one is truly uh, <coughs> licensed teachers to uh, students. We are at 13.3 right here. The average is 13. Um, you can see there's a little variable. Um, we get to 15.4, 14.7, but there's also down here at Lafarge 9.5 teachers, uh, teacher just 9.5 students per teacher. Pardon me. So that is just the student to teacher ratio. And then the next slide is all staff is included in that. So student to staff ratio, which is why they are lower. So we are at 7.3. The average is 7.1. As we talk about um, budgets and staffing. Um, it is important that we stay within that uh, average range for our um, staffing numbers, otherwise the work becomes far more difficult if we are skewed. All right, the next one is the Wisconsin Forward Exam. Um, this is the fourth grade math proficiency. Black River Falls is here at 39% of our students were proficient. The average was 47.5. You've already seen that data, that's the 1617 math uh, forward data. The next one is fourth grade science. And Black River Falls is at 45, the average 55.4. Again, that's the 1617 forward exam. Eighth grade math, 23% proficient in <coughs> advance, the average was 31.8. And then ACT score, we were at 19, um, and the average for our region was 19.9. This is the second year, third year of all kids having to take it. Then we go to the charts, there's a whole lot of numbers there. Um, just this one, just to, for a real quick reference when you're looking through, this is that open enrollment uh, piece that we're always trying to capture. The district spends uh, over $600,000 on open enrollment. Um, so when we look at, for all of our CESA district, this is the number of people entering their district and this is the number of people exiting their district. So you can do some comparisons from other districts if you so choose. Uh, that one is the achievement stuff that was already in the other chart. Um, I did want to talk a little bit on this one, staffing and compensation. Yep. So this is the average admin salary and the average teacher salary. And we're going to talk a little bit about average teacher salaries. Right now, the Black River Falls average is at 48435 um, and I think in the next piece I have for you what the average is for our region, but that is the average teacher salary. The piece that I liked about this is sometimes we know that school financing is complicated and we talk about where our money comes from. Go ahead to the next one. Is I like this because you can quickly see what amount of our dollars come from local sources, what come from state sources, and what comes from federal. And so we look at our total budget, 36.9 of our funds come from local sources, 54.2 is from the state, with 6.7 from the federal government. And when I look at that, I'm reminded of how much educational policy comes from the federal government for 6.7% of our budget. Sometimes you wonder if it's mm -hmm. worth it, mm -hmm. but 67 is still an awful lot of money, and so I'm certainly not saying no to that. I'm just saying interesting to know. So um, There's more charts, but we don't need to spend all night looking through them. You have them in your packet, but I do appreciate this comparison. I think it's nice mm -hmm. to um, compare us to our region, and um, they just look at it in a lot of different ways, which is good comparison to hold us accountable and to, and to see. So. You know, I always thought that we had so many open enroll. That was the one that was interesting to me. It in. And when I looked at the other districts around, it's the same ratio. Uh -huh. And I always we're say that better. for a while we used to beat that all the time that we were a net loser in open enrollment. 
over 50% of the districts in the state are losers in open enrollment. And so, yep, it's too bad, and yep, we'd love to fix it, but... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's the law. We're going out then, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to go out. The places going that they're south. going in, they are pouring <laughs> in. <laughs> and then you look at our region, Alaska, there are people from um, West Salem and La Crosse and um, Holman and all of them going into the Onalaska School District. So Onalaska is one that's a big winner. All of those other guys end up losers. <coughs> Loser is a harsh term, but I mean, losing more kids then. Um, so the next document I wanted to show you also as we get ready for um, budget conversations, our CISA also did a comparison um, of just local uh, this was self-reported by each of the districts. We do a lot of these surveys just so each of us can kind of measure where we're at. So I've highlighted, this is the starting wage in each district and the highest wage in each district. So the BA plus zero, that is our brand new teacher out of college with no experience or credits, you're offered 35.1. And then our highest teacher is at 66.4. You can see um, that there are, they're kind of all over the map. However, if you look at some of them that are significantly higher, like 72, that's a lacrosse, that makes an awful lot of sense. They are um, highly competitive. They could go live in lacrosse and work in La Crescent or in Alaska or Holman or, you know. Um, so, uh, I, I, sh I should know this, but does that include like our counselors? Yes. Okay. As, as Not the, our, so if this makes sense to you, all of our DPI licensed staff, okay. not our school psychologists, okay, yeah. their okay. support services. So okay. They're not Thank included you. in here. But, Thank you. Um, Thank yes. you. And then if you would scroll just a little bit to the bottom, I highlighted us at the 35.1. The average for our region starting salary is 36.30. And then our high is 66. The average high is 59.7. Um, I brought this data to our career advancement conversation and shared with them. And it just so happened that most of the people there were our veteran staff, so they've been here a while. And they all looked at that and said, if our starting wage is lower than everybody else's, we might need to talk about that because we are having a hard time attracting uh, staff in the beginning because, again, there's not nearly the applicants that there used to be. And so um, perhaps that is an area that that group will make recommendations to adjust that bottom uh, to come up. Um, when we did our career advancement guide, we intentionally tried to slow down our top a little bit because our high was higher than the region, and so um, through the veteran status and the way theirs works, we have slowed the, that growth down a little bit from the rest. You move a little faster, your salary grows a little faster through here, and then when you get to that top status, it grows a little bit slower. So. Questions about that? Good information. Good. Any questions or discussion? Okay. Um, move on to workforce comparator data. So in an effort to continue to talk about budget and trying to be more transparent and more informative, um, as opposed to, again, just coming to you with recommendations in the end, I want to talk a little bit about workforce uh, when it comes to staff, because we know 80% of our budget goes towards our staff. So when we talk about any significant increases or decreases in our budget, it's got to be staff. It, 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 often leads to staffing because of that. So I want to give you just a little bit of background about staffing. So there is a group. Another arrow. Uh, seems like I'm going up, but it says down. Exactly, that's Sorry. Right. She was having trouble. If the high schoolers could figure it out, I should have too. Okay, so there is a group called the Seven Rivers um, Alliance, and it is a group that has been um, working. Chris Hardy, who used to be our chamber um, executive, is now the executive director of Seven Rivers Alliance. They put together the bulk of this data, and so I just wanted to give them credit for the data, and we're going to talk through some of it very quickly. So this is our whole Seven Rivers region, and it is just trying to paint the picture of the need for workers. This is not just education, this is workforce in general. So this is, again, not an education problem. This is a go ask any business and they are looking for people who need work. And so um, what it is telling us is that in the next 10 years, uh, we will need 15,321 new workers in our region. 
we are not the only district with declining enrollment. There are many districts who are getting smaller because the population is getting smaller. So when you look at that number, it is the rationale behind why so many businesses are interested in supporting kids through education because they need to attract them so that they are um, interested in that area moving forward. So just some background information. And Stephanie, please jump in if I'm somewhere that I shouldn't be. Um, so unemployment rate, this is also important because I feel like that's a conversation that we hear sometimes is that people just don't want jobs. Look at the unemployment rate right now. Um, you've probably heard it's at one of its all-time lows. This is a sign that most people that can work are working. Um, so it is not a matter that we have this workforce that is needed and all these people just not interested. The people don't exist. So this was interesting, the quarterly job turnover, if you remember, as part of our strategic plan, we measure staff retention and they're measuring turnover. They are saying quarterly they're turning over, uh, this is the United States is the green and the Seven Rivers is the blue. So they're at an average of 8 to 9 percent turnover on a quarterly basis. I included our Black River Falls data. This again is retention. So we would want the opposite. So our staff retention rate was 90%, which means our turnover rate would have been 10%. Um, and then our support staff turnover rate for 2006 retention rate was 91%, which means our turnover rate would have been 9%. I point that out because sometimes that's one of the frustrations we hear about is we always have to hire so many new staff. People are leaving education. People are. This is telling us that education, our district specifically, is within the norms of the region when it comes to turnovers of employees. And every business will tell you how costly in time, effort, energy it is to um, onboard new staff members. So just wanted to show that we are within the normal range there. Here's the share of the workforce by age. If you were curious if we are an aging population, um, 14 to 18, 19, 21, um, the biggest group is 25 to 34. We won't do a show of hands to see who's in that group. Um, 35 to 44. Um, this, uh, the 45, 54. It, interesting, the 65 to 99, there is still 5.7% in the U.S. and 5.6% uh, the Seven Rivers. So that is the workforce. Again, all occupations, not just education. And then I did just our district. And so um, we don't employ many 14-year-olds. So we start two, 22 to 24. Um, our tallest is the 45 to 54. So let's talk about what that's going to mean for the number of staff that we're going to need to attract in the next couple of years when um, 30, probably 32 of our current teachers are in the 45 to 54 range. Um, and, and I'm sorry, it's not teachers, this is all staff. So this is everybody who's employed by the district. I, I didn't mean to say that. 55 to 64 and then 65 to 74 um, is our, our last group. And so um, this paints a picture that we are going to need to really talk about how we're going to recruit people to want to come to a rural community. So I did our demographics. The average age of a staff member in Black River Files is 45. And so once again, I'm slightly above average, right? <laughs> Just kidding. Not that's everything here. <laughs> slightly above average. <laughs> you, you can be way above average. It's OK. Um, but then we also measured their average years of local experience. So not just teaching experience or education experience, but local. Our average years of local experience is 11 years in Black River Falls. Then we move on, labor force participation rate by age. Again, this is um, people who can and want to work are employed. That's um, graphic. This is a picture of a declining youth population. Again, I want to just be very clear that sometimes when we talk about open enrollment and our numbers getting a declining enrollment, people feel like our numbers are getting smaller because kids are choosing to go to other districts. I want to be very clear, we're declining in enrollment because there are fewer kids that live in our region and not just Black River Falls region, but this is showing us that um, in 2010, this is the, this, here's the projected population. Um, why aren't all the colors there? The top one is Madison. There we go, I can read them there. Madison, Minneapolis, United States, Seven Rivers region. And so when people talk about tourism, when they talk about your local economy, when they talk about how do we attract and retain people not just to the school district of Black River Falls, the whole Seven Rivers region, the, the decline in the number of youth is um, going to be a workforce problem for a lot of entities. Shelley, in rural communities, is there, like for students that 
are getting out of college in student debt, say. Mm -hmm. Is there like loan forgiveness? There is. That's for a, teachers in? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is. It, there's a program called the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program that if you work for any government entity, um, you can, you have to work there for 10 years. So you have to okay. pay your student loans for those first 10 years. Sure. And then after 10 years, there's programs that you could not all qualify, but you could get your, um, potentially get your loans forgiven after okay. that. In education specifically, there are areas of high need, special education mm -hmm. certainly being one of them, some of the other high uh, need areas that there are loan forgiveness programs specifically for educators. If, and there's also some if you teach in a high poverty area. And so okay. some of those do exist. It seldom takes away all of the debt, but it certainly does some. And I will tell you that that's been a recruiting technique of some districts that they've said will, um, pay you, uh, you help you with your student loan debt in addition to the salary. So yeah, we've not gone there. Um, so this is just that recap of what we talked about. Uh, we're less demographically diverse. Uh, unemployment rate is lower than the nation. Um, a fourth of the region's workforce is 55 years or older. Um, the young adults is declining, and that we have a higher labor force participation rate than the nation. But its age demographics doesn't bode well for future growth. So um, just kind of a summary of what we saw. Then they talk a little bit about talent supply. So according to this study that was done by the Seven Rivers Alliance, um, this is all industry sectors, and these are the fastest growing occupations. So they're saying from 2016 to 2026, not that these jobs are exploding the fastest, these are the areas of the greatest need. And you can see that both secondary school teachers and elementary school teachers made the chart up here. So it's general managers, heavy truck drivers, by the way, the size of the bubble um, is the projected average annual opening. So the bigger the bubble, the higher the need. So the general managers, registered nurses, heavy truck drivers, nursing assistants, teacher assistants, medical assistants, market research analysts, accountants, elementary school teachers, and secondary school teachers. So of the um, careers that are on here, three of them are groups that we need to employ. And so um, if you look over the next 10 years, it's certainly I feel like I'm all doom and gloom. That wasn't my intention, but um, I just want you to understand. Here's the other factor that um, we, we yes, reported. So this is the percentage of students entering college that say, when they enter college, I'm going to be an education major. And you can see this is percentage. So it used to be about 11% of students back in 1971. There was another peak in 2000, but it has been a steady decline since then. So 2016, um, less than 5% of students enrolling in college are saying that education is their major. And so um, it paints, again, a bleak picture for that workforce that we need to build. Dr. Searson, is that Southern Rivers or is that nationwide? Or what is this is um, Wisconsin. Wisconsin schools. I went, um, I found this on the DPI site. <coughs> Wisconsin schools. And I will be very specific, UW Wisconsin schools, the private schools were not included in that. However, okay. they, it's, the majority has always been from Wisconsin schools. Um, this was just another, oh, I didn't mean to do that. This was just another interesting um, emergency licenses issued by the Wisconsin DPI. So this is for this current school year. Now granted, there are 422 school districts in the state, but this is the number of teachers, teachers, people services, and administrators that were not licensed for the jobs that they currently hold because... Last year, 16, 17. 17. Yep, sorry, 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 sorry. Because the year had to be completed. 16, 17, the number of people who worked a full year without having that license because there was not enough licensed applicants to hold those jobs. Wow. And so um, we can just, again, look at what that projects for the future. Again, this was informative for you because when we talk about our budget, we can't always look to our people for those reductions because our people don't have to stay with us. They could make other choices if they wanted to, and um, it's just become a more and more competitive <coughs> world. Questions, comments? Doom and gloom. You're welcome. Yep. <laughs> we'll move on to the budget center allocations. And Jill is going to talk briefly about that. Annually, we bring this to you in February so that the buildings can start the process of building your budget. Um, chart's pretty simple. We kept the. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's real <laughs> simple right now. Can't even see it. I like that one. <laughs> 
I don't know why it does that after we do a PowerPoint and like goes away. Anyway, I've got that figured out now. Um, we've we've kept our per pupil allocations for each of our building budgets the same for the last uh, four years for sure, and we're proposing for 1819 that they remain the same as well. Um, there'll be some flux in their total allocation, the total dollars that they are given in the end, just depending on their enrollments that they have in their buildings. Um, but it's important that we kind of get that budget process rolling for them in their buildings, so we ask that um, you would take action on these uh, built per student allocations at this time. And the principals are okay with us not giving them any more money for five you know, years per student? I didn't, um, <laughs> have a great conversation with the principals about that. So More of the conversation comes when we're talking about things, what other yep. pot of money could this come out of? So this really, for um, intervention licenses is one example, each building used to give some money towards those and as their building needs have increased, we've, Stephanie's CNI budget has paid for more of those or the Title I budget has paid for more of those and so other items come out of the building. So it's not really the same. Uh, furniture was another one that we kind of yep. took off their hands a little bit last year as well. Um, Professional we development, they can apply to Stephanie from her CNI budget so the building's having to fund all of that themselves. So, But you're absolutely right. No more means no more. Yeah. So, how do we decide on that number? Oh, this has been um, a process developed a long time ago. Even my predecessor probably developed it. And the high school gets a little bit more because of the shop and different consumables that they use you know, for tech ed and art and family consumer ed. The middle school has a little bit more of that. Um, Red Creek does a little bit more travel for field trips and things, so that's why their um, per pupil amount was a little bit more than uh, 4th Street. So that's kind of a hierarchy that we've used. Um, I meet with them every year. We talk about what kinds of things that they're funding, and it, it's tight. I mean, they, they are doing a lot of minimal things. So here's my confusion, and pardon me. <laughs> so it says per pupil allocation. Mm -hmm. When we looked at that big thing, it said per pupil allocation 13,000 or sure. something. So, so, so that that we looked at would include the teacher salaries and the bus driver salary. It would include all of those things. Oh, okay. This the is, building. the teachers come out of district dollars. They don't budget for that. This is basically supplies in, oh, in their buildings. The they do like building. their copy machine, their Skyward license, um, supplies, that kind of stuff comes out of their building per pupil so allocation. This is physical stuff or trips or whatever. Right. So, so they would take this okay. amount. They, they'll they take this. They'll talk about how many kids they're going to have next year. And then the principal is given this amount. Then the principal works with all their teachers to see what slice of the pie each of the teachers get. So this has nothing to do with salary. Correct. Anything. So. It's just nope. physical. Yep. Okay. So there are some differences in needs if we're using more electronic things because we don't have that much paper, we don't have that much right. stuff like that. Right. So there are some changes in how we're using the money. Yep. Unfortunately, some of our licenses uh, continue to go up, like our Skyward Student Information System. That license, we're kind of held captive by that. We have to have a student information system. They increase their license costs. The building's portion of that increases. I mean, there's some things that we're captive to, but there are other things that we can make adjustments to. Be interesting to see how much teachers spend out of their own pockets. I think it'd be different. I think the most would be up at the elementary. Thinking about I, that. So. Any questions or discussion? So we need to um, act on on this. Um, is there a motion to accept <coughs> to move forward with a no change in budget allocations with the present one being presented? I'll make them Thank you. Is there, is there a second? Scott oh, Scott did? Okay, you're quiet. Okay. Thank you. Any discussion or questions? So I just, I have another question. So this, this is for the educational part of it. Does, where does that money come from? Which part of our budget does Fun it Fund 10, the same one that salaries and benefits comes out of, the same thing buying a bus comes out of, the same thing that furniture comes out of. Really the only things that don't come out of Fund 10 would be that community service, small levy, um, food services, its own account. Um, what else? And this Joe? is the portion that we've decided should go to? The buildings direct this funds is what it boils down to. The buildings direct these okay. pieces. Right. Any more questions? Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say yes. 
Yes. yes. Opposed? Okay, motion carried. You received the meeting minutes in your packet. Um, is there anything you want to pull out for questioning or changes? Make a motion to approve the meeting minutes. Thank you. I'll second. Thank you. All in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carried. Move on to Dr. Severson's report. I mean, I apologize up front, I have a lot of randomness. So, <laughs> here we go. Um, the first one I wanted to update the board a little bit about school safety. Obviously, that's a topic that has been on everyone's minds most recently. I sent out the um, just kind of safety measures update last week. Um, I received an awful lot of positive feedback from families about that. And um, specifically, there were two families um, elementary wide. One of them said, Thanks for you know um, including the parents in this discussion. I was able to ask my son about the last drill, and he told me about it and you know what it felt like, all of that stuff. And then another family said, "We're new to the district, and I don't know how else we would have known about this." And so it feels really great that there's a plan in place. And so um, very positive reaction to that. What it has also um, done is Jackson County um, Sheriff um, Waldera has asked for uh, some what of a task force between the three school districts, um, Alma Center, us, and Laura's Medoro, to work together to have a consistent response. Because as the Sheriff's Department, they're partners with us, but they are also partners with the other two schools. And it's ironic that Kyle is here tonight, because uh, Kyle was also, um, he was one of the uh, staff members from the Sheriff's Department that was trained in Alice um, with our staff members. And he participated heavily, led some of the professional development for our teachers. Kyle also serves the other two districts but they don't have Alice they have other philosophies if you will um, but during our conversation I, we spent a good two hours down at the sheriff's department yesterday talking about the interest in getting more on the same page as opposed to each district doing their own thing um, Sheriff Aldera was you, I, have you chatted with him a lot since yes, yesterday? I have. Okay, so when you walked in I was like I wonder if they've had a talk because um, Sheriff Aldera was um, volunteering Kyle for a very <laughs> unique, I'm going to say promoting Kyle to a very <laughs> unique uh, role um, where he just said it, it is Still a high priority. <laughs> Pardon me? Still kind of in flux. We're not sure for exactly sure. where it's going to go. For sure. But he's extremely interested in increasing the police presence in all of the schools. And in a way that we talked about, um, it was interesting during the conversation because he started off saying we want him at the high schools. And then the more the superintendents talked, um, we said, he said, I can't even believe I'm hearing that this happens at the elementary school. I feel like that's where we need to be. And we said, yeah, the problems don't start at high school. That's where the law gets more involved because we're not calling the police when they're younger necessarily. But a police officer has different avenues to intervene with families when they're younger than a school staff member would. And so the hope of Chief Moen and Sheriff Waldera was that we could work together to, um, he said, place an officer, and then he goes, oh, I might as well just say it, I'd like it to be Kyle. And I said, great, we'd love it to be Kyle, too. <laughs> so uh, he's also pushing the other two districts to become Alice trained. Um, they have some concerns, and, and so you know, um, there are there's lots of articles that say Alice drills and training is traumatic for kids, and that we shouldn't be practicing these things because it creates negative images in their mind, and they associate school with those negative things. I'm going to remind everyone, I know I told you the story at the time, when we had that bus that flipped over on its side, just the previous week we had done that evacuation drill, and when that bus flipped and the driver was pinned and hunking out of his seat, those kids knew exactly what they were supposed to do. They helped each other open the exit door, and they helped each other out the rest of the way. And so I get it's an uncomfortable topic, but unfortunately it's also our reality. And so muscle memory matters, and just having people go through um, the actions matter. So we agreed that it is a multifaceted problem. We've also had um, some parent advocacy for the school sponsoring a walkout. Um, We've been pretty clear that the school's not interested in advocating anti-gun, the school's not interested in blaming mental health, the school's not interested in any of those. The school recognizes one piece of legislation is not going to solve all of our problems and that it is a combination of so many different factors that we are dealing with. And so we will graciously appreciate any help and partnership that we can get in addressing the problem. So I think the three districts are going to work more closely together. Obviously funding is going to become a problem. Um, I have not looked recently into um, school liaison 
uh, grants. However, I don't know if you just saw the latest news out of the assembly. Um, I feel like a discussion this board is going to have to have at some point is our philosophy on um, weapons in our schools. Um, I have a pretty strong personal opinion on that, and I would just share Chief Moen made an exceptional argument yesterday. He just said, I would never walk into a classroom and pretend to be able to address the needs of those students at the level of professionalism that your staff does. I would never pretend to be able to do that. Can I talk to a kid, maybe show them how to do something? <coughs> yep. But does that mean that I'm qualified to teach? He said the amount of training we go through as police officers in that decision making as to when to use deadly force or not, do you really <laughs> want to put that on your teachers? And again, I have a very strong personal opinion about that. But I feel like that's a discussion that we're going to have to have at some point because um, they're passing, uh, it's already been through the assembly maybe on its way to the house uh, about hiring, giving districts money to hire armed guards. I don't like that term armed guards. I would love a liaison officer to help us be proactive and build relationships and be there to be helpful should a crisis situation arise. And so um, that is obviously right in the forefront of everybody right now, and so we'll continue to follow that. I will be looking for some grants um, uh, to help possibly, but it definitely sounds like the county wants to be a driving force between all three schools working together. And, and we already work very closely on many other things with both Melrose and Alma Center. Um, the one complication, and it's not a complication, we are lucky enough that we also have the Black River City Police that services many of our schools as well. And so the, they have no relationship with the other two schools because they don't deal, work with them. Um, and so I just added that I would want to include um, Chief Buck. And, and, and there was also a city police officer that was trained in the Alice when we went through that as well. And so I just don't want to feel, anyone to feel like we're excluding in any way, shape, or form. Because again, we're the lucky recipients of help from both agencies and we wouldn't want to offend anybody along the way. So. Um, Kyle, did you want to say anything about that since you, sorry, Tom is distracting you now. Uh, Kyle, Mr. You, you sat through that whole meeting. Was there anything you wanted to say about that, or were you just coming to hear? Um, I, uh, I was, uh, I was actually going to talk to you briefly at the end, just to okay. let you know that I had talked to the sheriff and Perfect. Chief Moen. He said and, I did uh, it on the public record. I'm so racking my brain at this point with a overload of information, trying to figure out where we're going to go from here. Awesome. Um, but. Uh, to your point with the city PD, keep in mind that Dean Taylor um, was the other officer. Was. That was I couldn't involved. remember who it was. Um, okay. And he, uh, yep. as far as I know, he's going to be retiring. Correct. Yeah. 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 Or yeah. He is retired yeah. now. So, okay. Um, so Thank you. I guess if, if we're looking for a second law enforcement um, you know, asset in that role, uh, we might want to approach uh, sure. Chief Bakken about. Yep. Uh, but maybe trying to get someone else you bet. online for that. Um, and then, yeah, I guess at this point, I don't have a whole lot to say up front about it because we're still not exactly sure what the scope of this whole thing is. During the course of this two hour meeting, suddenly Kyle was designated as a school liaison officer for all the county schools. And I just said, Did you guys really just decide that right now? Yep, we kind of made it up as we were going along, they said. So, welcome. <laughs> No, Kyle. Truly, we're excited to we're excited to see what we can accomplish with this. And so, any any time, please let's get together and have conversations. I, they wanted you to go to all the schools, and I said maybe all the schools could come to us, and you could just join us here instead of you having to have three separate conversations. Having one would be nice. Yeah. All right. Uh, apparently, we're going to be having some meetings here in the next couple weeks and yeah. getting some stuff sorted out there. Yeah. Um, you know, my, my ultimate goal on this, you know, outside of the ALICE training and stuff like that is, you know, just a more comprehensive um, look at, at training and, and uh, um, education from my perspective yeah. to, the, to the kids and the staff um, to build just more of a preparedness mindset to be able to, to deal with challenges as they come, whether it be a threat in the school, whether it be a you know tornado drill, whether it be a fire, whether it be a car crash on the interstate, you know, to have a better, um, I guess, pocket full of skills to be able to to, to better um, 
deal with those kind of unusual situations when they come up. Perfect. Perfect. We're excited at the opportunities. Um, and then just a quick one for the board. Both the boys and girls hockey co-ops are up for renewal. I didn't bring them to you because there's no changes. If, does anyone see a need to put it as an action item or are you okay continuing as is? All right. Um, and then I wanted to highlight um, Lindsay Lewis, a uh, science teacher at the high school, and Stephanie Brigham worked together on, um, they hosted a luncheon here that Patty was actually a part of. It was a health sciences occupations class that is new at our high school as a way to address the workforce needs in the healthcare profession. Um, and they hosted a luncheon where they invited a really diverse group of healthcare professionals in the community and asked them great questions about what can we do to support their work and what did they have to offer as far as opportunities for our kids. And um, Lindsay felt great about the number of speakers and stuff that she's going to be able to have, as well as bringing the kids um, around for visits and jobs and all of that stuff. And so it really was the first time in a really long time that we brought that many different agencies together to have those discussions, and it was really well done. So Lindsay and Stephanie both did a really great job. Well, we talk about jobs, um, eighth grade tried something new this year. It has always been an expectation um, that every eighth grade student go out and do a job shadow, but it has never been super monitored. It was just kind of thrown out there. Many kids would just go with their parent to work. Um, but this year, the two school counselors at the middle school, as well as Carol Nortman and Brian Stemper, the two CTE areas there, and Stephanie, they went through each kid's career cruising into their areas of interest and they then identified, all, they contacted all these businesses and they matched a kid's interest in career cruising to one of these businesses. Then they worked with our transportation department and they dropped these kids on and off all of 35 different business placements. 35, 35 or 65? 60. 60, sorry. So 65 different. the first two of our and then like 30 the next one. Okay, so. So every single eighth grade kid went out in this one day, it was job shadow day, and there were business partners that hosted kids that haven't had a connection with our district in a really, really long time. And the eighth grade kids came back so excited about their opportunity. And so many of those businesses said, that didn't hurt, I'd love to do more. You know, I, they kind of got that feeling like this was really a positive thing for us as well, and we'd love to engage more. So I love that kind of community outreach, it's really great. Um, we've talked about Redefining Ready, just wanted you to know that there's a statewide consortium of superintendents that are really nailing down that Redefining Ready and talking about what, um, how do we collect that kind of data locally and if the state is going to ask us to report it out, could we make a recommendation to the state as to what a Redefining Ready <coughs> scorecard could look like? They already issue our report card each year we're asking them to augment that with some of that redefining ready criteria. And so they asked for um, superintendents that were interested and I joined that consortium. And so we've met once so far, but there are about five meetings throughout the course of the year um, that it, it's really interesting discussions as to how schools are preparing kids for a college career. Um, it's good stuff. So I just wanted you to know that I joined that. Um, and then I um, wanted to talk a little bit about another partnership. Um, so the London Community Center, we know that when they built it, we received the field house, and there were special occasions that we listed on that agreement that we got the field house. Graduation was one of those days that we put down there. Um, there was a like 100 team tournament that uh, wanted to book the weekend of graduation. And so Carl Holmquist called and he begged and he was like, oh my God, do you know how much money that is for our community? And I said, it's graduation. We'd love to have it out on the football field. That would be our preference, but... And, and he's just like, I understand, I understand. So I threw out a few, uh, I threw out a couple other suggestions, like, you know, you could use our other gyms, but just not the field house. And, and he said, couldn't you guys use the Sam Young? And I said, honestly, it gets so hot in there. It is a small <coughs> capacity and it's just hot that everyone is uncomfortable. I said, I'm sorry to be a stickler. We want graduation day. Then I said, you know what? The District 1 Community Center just opened up and they have several gymnasiums. And so I hooked them up. They are now using those gyms as well. The tournament will go on, and we have the field house for graduation. So he was ex super excited that the community still gets a benefit from all of that um, travel and all that stuff, and we still have the field house for graduation. Last from me is it is FFA week, if you were unsure of that. Oh, yeah. So if you haven't had your milkshake, maybe you'd like to stop up because they're making them during focus time uh, this week. <laughs> uh, Stephanie wanted to talk a little bit about the business roundtable lunch that was in your packet. Um, I'll be just brief. Um, so Jill and I have been working on putting together um, 
this event. So we invited uh, business folks far and wide in our um, kind of region. I would say mostly Weber Falls, but some Jackson County um, businesses as well. Um, and the, you can kind of see that was in your packet, the um, flyer. Um, but the, our objective, I guess, is to engage in some continued conversation with businesses around what can we do as a system to help prepare um, the students that are going to be entering the workforce? What are they looking for when it comes to um, folks entering the workforce? And then also what, um, as a system, can we do to help them? There's sometimes needs that they might have to use our spaces that they don't know are possible uh, partnerships that we could have. Um, and in the same way, kind of that reciprocal, what are some ways that we can continue to partner with them? Um, Jill had a great example of a possible um, Sometimes we're short bus drivers. Perhaps there's a um, business that has lots of folks with CDL licenses that wouldn't mind subbing for us every now and again if we had that kind of prearranged. And so some little things like that, but then really our focus is on how can we help um, grow opportunities for students to help them um, engage in work-based learning opportunities, job shadows, some of those kinds of things. And so um, kind of a broad conversation opportunity. So um, you can kind of see in the beginning we're going to do a little bit of sharing with um, some areas leaders and kind of their uh, top three goals in the next five years for our workforce um, and our region um, and then just a little bit of kind of an opportunity to share with them here are some of the things that we're doing as a district to help prepare students for um, the world of work and for um, education and careers um, after they leave us as a system um, and then a little bit of that wise um, plan that Shelly shared earlier just again helping to connect some of the dots because we're all kind of in this together and needing um, to grow our local workforce. Um, and then really spending the bulk of our time talking about those possible partnerships, how can we help each other. And so um, from that, we'd like to have a um, more often meeting, or not more often, but a smaller group. We invited lots of people. We have about 40 people um, right now that are slotted to come and still more RSVP is coming back every day, which is exciting. Um, how we're going to all fit in here will be a little interesting, but that's okay. Um, that's a good problem to have. And so after that, we are just going to invite an open invitation for a group of like 10 to 12 people to come together maybe three times a year to kind of continue that conversation just so that we have, um, they can continue to hear some, some things that we're doing as a district to help prepare students and kind of be that summing board, but then also be that opportunity to have those continued partnership discussions. So, any questions? Was this originally scheduled for the 28th? Mm -hmm. That's what I had on my I calendar. And I and I am so sorry that I'm not going to be here. It was the 28th. Was it, was, it was my error, honestly. In our notes, I put the 28th, and I invited the 27th. And um, oh, okay. the reason we chose the 27th I, is because it is the um, day of ACT testing. Okay. And so we wanted teachers to be able to um, facilitate those conversations um, with the business partners, not just Jill and I. And so um, it was that. Okay. So, um, <laughs> so. But um, board members are invited to attend and be part of that because it certainly does go along with our goals of um, creating our community workforce and, and help you know helping our students reach those goals. So, but I, I'm sorry I won't be able to be there, but yeah, I wish you success. I think it's a wonderful community engagement opportunity. So. And I know Dr. Kibasa has something she'd like to share. Actually, we're doing this together because okay. we, we plan this together. <laughs> so one of the things um, that has come up, a lot of staff have asked us for more information on dyslexia. Um, yes. I had a couple staff members that went to a training in Eau Claire and came back and said, wow, this was amazing. We need to learn more. And so we got together. We contacted Dr. Cammie Tillotson in Eau Claire um, that's at the Institute and asked her to come up and provide some information for us here. Um, and so if you go to the next couple slides, um, we'll go past that right now, but um, we had pro approximately 50 some staff members that attended the training. Um, all of our special ed staff were present. Um, you had... Yep, we had all of our reading interventionists, um, literacy coaches, um, and we did open it up to anyone that would like to attend. So we had several other classroom teachers that decided to attend. Um, we had some folks from the education department um, at the Coach of Nation that also joined us as well. And the objective of the training was to just really build awareness of what it um, feels like on the side of a student when they are struggling with uh, processing the language. And so we did um, six different activities. Two of them were um, writing based, two of them were uh, reading kind of based, and then the other two were auditory processing, kind of listening to directions and, and following those directions. And after that, our 
staff were, the, the staff had an amazing day that it went so fast. Um, we started this at 3.30 in the afternoon and we were still going at about quarter to six, six o'clock and nobody got up to leave. They were all just, it was so amazing. And so um, some of our staff have said, you know what, when can we, our aides learn more? When can the assistants learn more? So she is coming back on March 27th. Um, I've set up for that early release day for our assistants for her to come back and provide some more training. So we'll look at our assistants that day and anyone who wasn't able to come and we'll open that up to some more, some more of our staff that day. But we can look at um, just a little bit about dyslexia and looking at um, this is information from Tammy is that it's a neurological condition that affects language acquisition, processing, and decoding. Um, it's a disability in learning. It's not has nothing to do with intelligence. Um, this is the part that's pretty interesting here when you look at it. It affects both boys and girls equally. And current research cites that approximately 20% of our population has a learning disability. Of that 20%, 80% of those individuals have some kind of reading disorder that could be tracked to dyslexia. So. Um, some inf interesting information, but um, we are looking at her providing more professional development opportunities and what those possibilities are, we're not really sure yet. And, and I would just add that over the last couple of years we have had um, some parents who have been extremely frustrated with us because dyslexia is a medical diagnosis, it's not an educational diagnosis. And so every student who is medically diagnosed as dyslexic does not necessarily equate to a student with a disability because there are certainly varying degrees of coping, varying degrees of dyslexia. And so for years we've had parents very frustrated with us saying, but well, what are you doing for my kid if not an IEP? And and so we are super excited that we found this lady who has some strategies and um, people are just, because to be honest it's been this unknown, when you go to school to be a teacher they don't talk to you about that because it's not an educational diagnosis. I don't understand why, but it's not. And so nobody has a toolbox for it and parents look at us like, what do you mean? What do you mean you're not going to? And so, I mean, we've certainly made accommodations, we've certainly tried different things, um, but it feels really good to have found somebody that is digging in and teachers are excited to have the resources, so, yeah. Great. Thank you. Thanks. I know the elementaries have gone. Mr. Chambers, did you have anything for an update or no? ACT next Tuesday. Okay. Juniors have been well prepared for it, so we're hoping it's going to go well. That's all I got. Did you want them to come and take the test or proctor? Or just yeah, you guys want to come and come. Always welcome. That's all we have. Okay, and Mr. Rue is gone tonight, so. He is on vacation. Okay, right okay. okay. Now we'll move on to Wisconsin Association of School Board um, and other reports. Does that, many of us went to the convention, so does anyone have anything that they'd like to share or that kind of stood out to them? Well, I would just say that I was your representative at the delegate assembly and there was very little conversation of any of those um, initiatives that they would bring forward. The one that had the most conversation was the debate about um, being reimbursed for public schools transporting to vouchers or private schools. That got the most debate, but it, they did a little bit of word tweaking and then they passed it on. Mm -hmm. so there was very little discussion on this. I think the most interesting one I went to was um, Moston School District has a teacher prep class and club. So they're trying to um, grow their future teachers within their district. Mm -hmm. I've actually called them because you mentioned that to me while we're down there. So I've actually yeah. called them because you think about what we've just talked about. We did that health science occupation thing for people in that field. We've talked about that um, business luncheon that we're having. But what are we doing to grow our own <laughs> um, workforce? We certainly have kids that go work at Blast, but um, it's nothing organized. Like, yeah, we can do better. Okay. Um, after the convention. Um, as president of Wisconsin, I went to the um, National School Board Association Equity um, Conference in Washington, D.C., and the National School Board Association has issued an equity statement that they would like all school boards to review and possibly adopt or consider writing their own equity statement. And I know that's been a discussion around this board a lot, and but they're recommending a um, a statement, so I'll, sh I'll, sh I'll share that, or you can see it on the website too. And then after the equity conference was the NSBA, a legislative ad advocacy, and Washington does that 
big. Um, we have representatives come in and, and talk to all of the school board people from all of the states. And when you have all 50 states there, um, <coughs> absolutely we could be very proud of um, the things that Wisconsin does. Our team, our executive team, was able to visit every single Wisconsin legislative office. The only one that wasn't available um, personally was um, Paul Ryan, but he had his education um, um, aid there. So uh, I guess the, the, the things that we um, talked about absolutely was impact aid. And if you read the Banner Journal, she kind of covered that because I it was, a, it was right when I was out there when she was trying to get some information with me for me. And um, the impact aid definitely is, is always up for um, being eliminated. And it's bipartisan support of that. And it really affects Wisconsin and especially our district because it's uh, na native land um, <coughs> or like for, even in our area, Fort McCoy, military, military and then it, it, it is even with the, um, the forest lands too, the federal forest lands. And if that is eliminated, um, we, we will lose a lot of money. <laughs> um, so we we're advocating for that. And then the College and Technical Education Act has been um, approved by the Congress, but not the Senate. So we were trying to move that along. Um, every student succeeds, Zach. Um, we absolutely just thank them for their support of that, giving us local control. When we talked about all the time growing our own staff, um, growing our own um, teachers from our from our staff that are already working, if we recognize that a uh, aide has really good skills and want to send them on, a lot of the schools are using their Title II money to to assist with that, and so I. Just wanted to bring that up. That's that's been talked about a lot. Are Title II funds re eliminated? Completely? Title II funds? Title II? Um, they were severely cut for this year, okay. as okay. well as our Title I funds. I think we lost about $70,000 okay. between, okay. between, between both. Okay. Yeah. And then the individuals. Um, not to rain on your parade, it wasn't no. a good idea. Okay. <laughs> Those monies are right. Well, well let's look into keep, keeping that Title II money yep. going up. The, and then the IDEA, IDEA the um, Disabilities Education Act, I mean, when that was passed by law, 60% was covered. We're down to 13%, guys. And we have to provide that. And that means taking away from other programs when we have a high cost special ed program. And um, Everyone wants to get that back up, but if it goes back up, it's going to go up maybe 1% a year or something like that. But all the legislators wanted to move that forward, but it keeps going down. And um, there was great frustration I expressed by, by the legislative um, staff as well as the elected officials. Did you ask them how bad do they want it then? <laughs> if they but say they, they want it, you know, it just, going backwards? Well, what they, they said, they made, there was one person who made the comment, I'm sure you get more done at your board meeting than we've gotten done in the last six months. They're very frustrated that things aren't moving forward in Washington. And um, it, you know, we were there right before a possible shutdown. So everyone was, it, it, it was the, the tone was, was a lot of frustration. Um, but absolutely, everyone likes education. So that was an interesting interesting type and so I um, <laughs> and then I just got back from um, the Dells um, the, attended a legal and human resource uh, uh, I guess it was called a seminar I shared some information with Shelley very timely stuff on um, student um, speech rights and Expressing themselves, so that was that was good. First Amendment rights. Um, what else? Um, we. I just feel so proud when I I met these national things that Wisconsin is noted as having, if not the top, one of the top technical college systems in the whole nation. And um, when when we talk about our our students going and, and getting these credits before. They, they get out of our high school and, and we're 
the technical colleges are responding to the, the needs of the communities and the businesses. It just makes me so proud in that our, our system has changed over um, so all of their credits are accepted at, at other universities that our technical college credits have gotten to that level of the higher education. And I, it just, I'm just very proud of that. And I think we need to just recognize what a gift we have to have this right in our own back door that our students can just go downtown to get some of these opportunities. Not, not every state has what we have. And that, that always is a good thing. So that's what I have to share. Any other people want to comment on any workshops or? I'm wondering, did they talk out at the national level on the No Time to Lose initiative? Mm -hmm. Did they talk anything about that? The yes, um, we, we held one, one big session on that. Um, every state has been given um, the charge to take charge of No Time to Lose in their state and come up with um, how um, to address that. Um, and, and you got you got a copy of that report. I, I sh we shared that out on the packet one time too, and then at the convention that was available as well. Yes, that that is moving forward. That is moving forward. So we will be hearing more about that in the future. But they've got a lot of other things ahead of it <laughs> to, to address too. So we'll see. <clears throat> okay. Um, any agenda items that you'd like on the? on the agenda. I have the Financial Institute for Action, and a mm -hmm. reminder that yeah. March is typically when you do my evaluation, so okay. there'll be a closed session posted for that. Okay. Yeah. okay. I'm, I'd like to, um, at policy committee not that long ago, we reviewed our educational policy on balance and curriculum, and I'd like to review that. I'd like to know how we're making sure that that's happening. Okay. I can't remember the policy number off the top and of my head. And would you want that to the policy committee, or would you want that to the full board? Well, I think it's already, the policy has already, is already in place. I think we should review how it's being implemented. <coughs> so that would be a full board then? Correct. OK. 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 Um, are we ready to adjourn? OK. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. OK. 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 Laurel <laughs> second. OK. All in favor say yes. 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 Opposed. Okay. We are adjourned at 8.22.